So we're ready then, eh? Recording call recording. Oh, great. All right. Go on, Richard. All right. Well, welcome everyone um, to the uh, Journalism's Roundtable. My name is Richard Prince. I write a column called Journalisms at journal-isms.com. It is about diversity issues in the news business. And this roundtable is an extension of that. Uh, we've been doing this since 1999. And the purpose of it is to network and to learn. And, and we have uh, some, uh, some good uh, vehicles for both of those uh, objectives. Uh, in terms of the networking, uh, everybody is encouraged to use the chat. And on Facebook, you can use the, uh, the comment section. And in terms of the learning, we have a stellar group of, uh, of uh, experts and speakers for everyone. Uh, last, uh, the last round table we had was a, a month ago and we celebrated um, uh, Gamble and Huff, the uh, producers and, and songwriters who were celebrating the 50th anniversary of, um, of their Philadelphia International Records. And we had people from the Motown Museum who told us about uh, the 50th anniversary of Marvin Gaye's album, What's Going On? So this is sort of a segue because one of the songs on that album was about the environment. And that was 1971, which is about just about the time that the EPA was, was created. So, uh, so I hope everything's, um, uh, I hope the segue works. Uh, let's see what else we need to say. Uh, oh, well, I guess that's it. The first order of business is, is, is Brett Paul here? Here yet? Okay. Well, we're gonna, we're gonna uh, wait for Brett to arrive before we, uh, before we introduce uh, uh, one of our honorees. And I guess we'll go right into um, uh, our discussion of uh, the topic, which is uh, what, what do journalists need to do to better cover environmental racism and environmental justice? And so uh, I've asked Charles Lee to kick it off. He's the head of environmental justice for the EPA. And uh, take it away, Charles. What do we need to be, do be doing? What do we need to know? Thank you, Richard. And uh, uh, th thanks for the opportunity to be here uh, today. And I look forward to a uh, great discussion with some great guests and, um, and, uh, and, and, and others. So, um, you know, I, I think I want to um, just kind of um, answer your question from the perspective of having worked on this issue for uh, nearly 40 years, having helped to give you know, birth to environmental justice um, going back to the early 1980s. Um, and when I was working for the uh, United Church of Christ Commission for Racial Justice, after which I went to EPA. And so this, this is just informed by you know, all that. So I think the first thing in terms of better um, covering environmental justice is really to uh, get to um, engage with the community, to immerse yourself in the impact of communities, um, and to get to know the issues, the concerns, and the leaders uh, and the strategies that they're using. I mean, that's just one area of uh, such huge, um, incredible uh, wealth uh, of, um, of uh, work and uh, knowledge. Uh, but you know, it is a foundation by which uh, we all understand this issue. The second is that um, there are mo many uh, issues um, and uh, coalitions, um, you know, uh, environmental justice is uh, related to climate issues, to transportation issues, housing issues, you can go health issues, you can go on. And so this whole idea of intersectionality is really important uh, and understanding how these issues come together. There are strategies, and like I said, coalitions coming together that are really um, unique, innovative, and offer, you know, the kinds of multi-faceted solutions that's going to be necessary. Um, the third, I think, um, is to better understand the science and the science of um, you know, understanding disproportionate environmental impacts, environmental uh, burdens and benefits and how they're distributed is getting better and better. Uh, and so it's really important to, um, to um, cover that and to make sure that the, uh, the public uh, understands and knows that 
um, and uh, and you know how and really kind of look at how all those kind of new tools and new analytic frameworks and um, you know are being used to to uh, uh, to better inform the way we think and understand and address these issues. Um, and then lastly, I think um, you know we always say. You, in order to truly understand environmental justice, you have to understand the roots of it. And so things like uh, racism, um, you know, um, uh, systemic racism, things like that are, are just part of the tapestry of how these uh, issues unfolded over time uh, and, you know, are really important uh, to get people okay. to better understand this. So I just stopped there, uh, Richard. I, I said a lot and there's a lot more that we could talk about. Okay. Well, we have people who, plenty of people who have questions, but let me go to Mustafa now and um, and at, ask him to weigh in. What, uh, what, Mustafa? What would you like to see in newspapers and on television and on radio uh, about environmental justice? Well, first of all, let me say, you know, um, I agree with everything that Charles just said. Had the chance to listen and learn underneath of him for a number of years. All right. Uh, people have heard me across the country talk about, we need to make sure that we're having real talk, whether it's in print media, whether it's on television, whether it's in the documentaries that are created, or hopefully one day uh, also in mo uh, major motion pictures. Uh, mm -hmm. So if we are being authentic in the trueness of what's going on, and I think there are three or four different areas that we have to hit on. Charles hit on one of them. We need to be honest about systemic racism and the role that it has played and many of the impacts that we see playing out across the country. Uh, the discrimination and the biases also, because we have to make sure that we're also highlighting the impacts that are happening in lower wealth white communities. Um, so when we understand um, how uh, policy and racism uh, and disinvestment in communities has played out uh, and help people to understand, most folks don't know in our country that there was policy uh, that played a role in the genocide of indigenous brothers and sisters. It was policy uh, infused with racism that garnered uh, people thinking that they had the right to be able to go to Africa and bring them to this country and then have them work for free. So when we talk about workers' rights, you know, we have to go back to the earliest set of folks who were dealing with these injustices that were happening. We also have to make sure that we're anchoring it in the realness of all these different dynamics that are happening in our communities in a holistic way. When we know that we've got, what is it, 140 million people in our country who are poor and lower wealth, then we understand if we tell the stories properly, we can show how disinvestments, how these impacts play a role in that number. When we got 80 million people who are uninsured and underinsured in our country, then we have to make sure that we are also infusing that into our storytelling to help people to understand that when somebody is polluted uh, or have these impacts that are going on, how it actually impacts them on the healthcare side of the equation. When we're dealing with these food justice issues of 24 million people, you know, who are dealing with that issue. Once again, it is these choices that people have made um, about who can access land, what type of land that you can utilize and the pollution that may be associated with that land. It plays a role in the dynamics that are going on inside of our country. We have to make sure also as uh, folks who are storytellers or reporters or a number of the other folks who are helping to frame out these narratives. And we're also telling the truth also about our homeless population, which is, you know, also being severely impacted along with other folks of color um, who are dealing with extra sets of impacts that we often don't frame into our storytelling. We don't share with folks that 60 million people have been dealing with unhealthy water over you know, the last decade or the fact that we got 135 million folks who are breathing unhealthy air and 30 million of those are kids. So I say all that to say that we have to anchor folks in the reality of the dynamics that are going on. And then if we wanna have real talk once again, in this transformational moment that we find ourselves in, we also gotta help folks to understand how resources have flowed or not flowed, what were the, the, the stop gaps, if you will, uh, and then also how are we going to make sure there's real accountability in a new set of resources that are going. Then we take it one step further, and I'll be short. The next step in the storytelling and the narrating that has to happen is around the clean economy. So if we know that as people of color, less than 2% of the businesses that are owned right now in the clean economy space are, are, are us, then there's a huge amount of opportunity that's there, but we've got to also help folks to understand one, where the gaps are, and two, to highlight the incredible sets of work that for some of the folks who have been able to uh, find traction in this space are doing so that folks see themselves reflected. You see yourself reflected in the storytelling that's happening in the written form. You see yourself reflected um, on, 
on the TV shows, um, on the news shows. Let me back up real quickly. And let me just call out this fact. Media Matters put out a story not long ago that when it comes to environmental justice, when it comes to climate justice storytelling, it is a, a very tiny percentage that is going on by actually having practitioners who are actually sharing that. Uh, and, even, and even when it comes to those reporters who are on the news sharing the stories, it's a very small part also. So we will talk about the impacts of climate change if there is a hurricane or if there is a extreme weather event that's going on, but we won't tell the fullness of how do we get ourselves here? How does fossil fuels play a role in that and many of the other toxic chemicals that are part of that mix? So I say all that to say that we have a huge set of opportunities, but we have to anchor it in authenticity. And we also have to tell the fullness of the story, which can be difficult if you got a four minute segment. Trust me, I've done enough of those four minute segments to know how tough it is, but we've got some real opportunities, especially as more brothers and sisters are being given an opportunity, both on the reporting side to tell the realness what's going on. And of course, all of you who work in this space know that it really comes down to those editors and producers are playing a critical role in what's actually uh, what the end product looks like. So we've got some opportunities. I look forward to unpacking with everybody around some of this. Great, 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 great. Well, since you mentioned Media Matters, I, I think we can go to Ovaldo right now since he's the one who wrote that story um, about the Cooper of Media Matters. Let me, let me see if I can find you on the screen here. <laughs> okay. Well, just go ahead and start. I'll, I'll, oh, there you are. Okay, got you, got you. All right. You've, you, you've heard your, your, uh, your story <laughs> mentioned. What do you have to say about uh, or elaborate on, on the point he made? Yeah, that was an amazing shout out. And first, I want to say hello, everyone. I want to thank you, Richard, for inviting me to the round table today. Um, I'm honored to be speaking alongside such an esteemed group of experts. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about our recent environmental justice study about coverage and broadcast media. A little about Media Matters, we're a nonprofit progressive research and information center um, that comprehensively monitors, analyzes uh, conservative misinformation. Our program, the Climate Energy Program, the one I'm a part of, we advocate for more and better media coverage of climate change and environmental justice and related issues. Um, so with regards to the environmental justice study, we found that from 2017 to 2020, 11.4% of corporate broadcast morning and evening news segments included a mention of how environmental pollution impacts, regulations, or health hazards specifically affect a particular demographic group. But that doesn't give you a truly accurate picture of the dearth of environmental justice stories being told on corporate TV news. Put another way, only 30 environmental justice stories aired during that four year span. And even the segments that applied an environmental justice lens to a particular story often barely skimmed the surface to contextualize how America's history of racial and economic injustice has forced low-income communities and communities of color to disproportionately bear the burden of polluted air, water, and land and the resulting harmful health outcomes. In short, as Mustafa alluded to, environmental pollution impacts were reported, but the injustices were not. 63% uh, of the environmental justice segments aired in 2017, which mirrored another problem that we saw in broadcast coverage of climate and environment, was the heavy emphasis on Trump administration actions. So when Trump rolled back, um, when he allowed the uh, fossil fuel infrastructure, such as Dakota Access and Keystone to go forward on indigenous lands, the decision to drastically shrink the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase National Monuments, we saw uptick of stories that at least mentioned the, that indigenous uh, communities were protesting these actions, but they were pretty shallow. Uh, the strongest segments that we saw were about adverse health effects of environmental pollution on marginalized communities. Um, but these were anomalies. Broadcast news was more often rife with missed opportunities to cover environmental injustice. Uh, despite compelling news hooks, they really applied an envir environmental justice lens to stories about disaster recovery, industrial accidents, and COVID-19 most recently that would have informed their viewers about the social, political, and economic factors that make socially marginalized communities less healthy, safe, and sustainable. Why is it important for news media to do a better job reporting on these issues? Good reporting can disrupt public apathy, frustration, and cynicism about the efficacy of environmental action. Um, too many groups uh, that are doing substantive work improving the material conditions of their neighborhoods and communities are laboring outside of the mainstream media spotlight, and they deserve some attention for their hard-won efforts and the work going forward. 
So to begin telling these, this untold story about the precarity faced by vulnerable and underserved communities living in the shadow of our nation's chemical complexes, they must begin reporting on how environmental justice intersects with the lives of everyday people and connecting environmental consequences to political and corporate policies and practices that lead to disproportionate and inequitable harm. They must also importantly amplify the voices of those on the front lines of these fights. So uh, thank you for your attention. I look forward to the upcoming conversation and discussion. Thank you. This is great. You know, we had um, a couple of months ago, we had a, uh, a conversation about, uh, about the churches who were, who were um, uh, who had banners burned on their front lawn by the Proud Boys. And the, 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 one of the takeaways that the, the ministers were saying is, we often in the media do not connect the dots. You know, we're, we're all in these silos. And that seems to be what you're all saying too. But in terms of uh, how the media has covered things, I'm glad to see Derek Jackson here, uh, who wrote a critique about how the Flint water crisis was covered, uh, which is probably one of the most famous uh, environmental disasters of the last few years. Uh, Derek, you want to tell us uh, what you found? Derek. Derek, where are you? Well, what? You just disappeared. Oh, there you are. Derek, can you hear us? You got to unmute. Yeah, yes, yes. Okay. Uh, so for some reason, my I, I dropped out for a second. Okay. So what'd you find? And uh, we, we, we're just talking about um, uh, the Flint water crisis being one of the most uh, well-covered and well-known uh, environmental disasters. And you did an analysis of the media coverage of that. Uh, so what did you find? Yeah, it was for a uh, uh, paper for the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard um, mm -hmm. back in. Uh, and uh, the, the, the key points was number one, uh, the media uh, came late to the crisis and in coming, the national media. There was plenty of local media coverage of the Flint water crisis, mm -hmm. uh, but the, the national media by coming late, they missed all of the protests by a, 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 a incredible multicultural world of people in Flint, uh, including ex-offenders uh, uh, ex um, who were doing part of the water, bottled water drives. So number one, they missed the agency of at the grassroots of people who were complaining about the switch to uh, from the Huron River to the Flint River. Uh, all of that agency was missed by the national media, by everyday folks. Um, second, by coming late and missing the agency of all the people of color and uh, that universe, um, the, the coverage ended up focusing on uh, the white heroes and the white saviors of the crisis, mm -hmm. um, the white, the scientists. Uh, so the, the, basically the national media coverage did not start until white scientists plus Mona Hanna Atisha, Iraqi American, uh, until they confirmed something that the, the people of Flint themselves knew for months, uh, confirmed that the water was, was, was poisoned. Um, so that's number two. So then that created a, um, a cycle. And uh, uh, once you go down that wormhole, the, site, the coverage was, um, ended up being so flawed that um, not a single black person in the coverage, uh, the, 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 the top victim, if there was a quote, top victim of the water crisis, there was a white woman um, in a fifth city that was 57% black, is 57% black. Mm. Um, the uh, top scientist hero uh, was a white guy. Um, and all of the international and national awards that went for uncovering the quote, Flint water crisis, it all went to those people. Not a single international or national award went to a black person and more to the point of coverage and le the lexicon of coverage. Um, not a single African-American in the Flint water crisis, even though, as I had said, black people were complaining uh, from ministers to ex, you know, uh, ex offenders to politicians, not a single African-American black person 
was called a hero by the mainstream press. Um, interestingly, alternate press, um, Al Jazeera, uh, The Guardian, Mother Jones, when they did their uh, you know, big takeouts on the Flint water crisis, they, the alternate media took the time to have at least one black person be a quote, hero. And um, so black people in the coverage and wrapping of the, uh, this uh, up, uh, black people were denied their agency um, uh, with late coverage and uh, were portrayed by the time as bad, if not worse, basically black people were, were, were depicted only, as, only and solely as victims without agency. So, um, and even like two, three, couple years later, I ended up writing a piece for Grist on the fact that uh, all the international awards, um, you know, kept going to the same set of uh, white and non-black people um, uh, that um, it, it just became a cycle unto itself. So the, uh, you know, the number one piece, the takeaway is obviously get on the ground, listen to people on the ground, don't wait, you don't have to wait for quote, sci quote, scientists who tend to be disproportionately white to validate the experience of people holding up bottles of orange and brown water. <laughs> Mercy. <laughs> <laughs> well, that sounds familiar. <laughs> Whether the subject is in the environment or other things. Now we have the, the good fortune of having on this call so many people who actually cover the environment. So uh, I want to hear from at least a couple of you about uh, some of the things you've heard so far. Anybody? Well, um, this is Mary Richard. I do want to say that when Houston happened with the flooding, um, with some of that was environmental, and on my podcast, <clears throat> Equal Time. I interviewed uh, Chriselle Paley, who's been on the ground for years because there were so many people of color who um, hadn't recovered from three years ago, Hurricane Harvey. And I also talked to Justin Anwinu, who is a really young brother, really, really active. And he's a community organizer in, based in Michigan um, mm -hmm. to, to tag on to what Derek was talking about. And he's an organizer with the Sierra Club. And he talked about how people always think of it as kayaks and people with backpacks and white folks, but it really is an issue of environmental justice. Um, and it's so, it's a whole mindset as Derek was saying on how it is covered. Um, and we don't talk about the urban piece of it. Um, uh, and also there's a uh, uh, Ayana Johnson, I believe her name is. And she is, uh, does the ocean, she uh, deals with waterways and she does, I've worked with her and, and talked with her. And she talks a lot about when you think of the environment and climate change in the oceans, that also is a very white uh, conversation. And they don't talk about it in terms of people of color and she's working to change that. So there are so many people doing the work but you really don't see them in the coverage as much. So um, if, if we wanna talk to people, there's a real host of people of color who are working in the space of the environment and climate change. All right, thank you, thank you. Um, is Jim Ascendio, are you still here, Jim? All right, Jim, Jim went away. Okay, he's, he'll return, I guess. He's down in St. Croix. Yeah, okay. Oh, you that. are? Yeah, well tell us, we just had Stacy Plaskett uh, a couple of uh, round tables ago, who's the delegate from the Virgin Islands. And so, uh, which includes St. Croix, uh, which is where you are and which is now in the news again over environmental issues. So tell us about that. It all uh, centers around what's called the Lime Tree Bay uh, Refinery. Uh, back uh, in the day, uh, Hess opened up a refinery here, then they joined with Hovenza of uh, Venezuela. And uh, in 2012, they shut down the refinery because the EPA well, dear, I'm on a um, Zoom call right this second. Yeah. The, uh, <laughs> Mute yourself, Ron. 
Yeah, he just did. Okay. Exactly. So they, they shut down the refinery in 2012. Uh, they were fine. They were uh, they signed up to a remediation package, but they just walked away from it and did nothing. And then uh, uh, some venture capitalists from uh, stateside got together uh, to uh, purchase the refinery. And uh, uh, that company is uh, called Arclight. And apparently, uh, President 45 had some sort of relationship with them. I'm still trying to figure out what that is, whether financial or just friendly or whatever. But apparently, uh, convinced EPA to uh, set aside uh, the requirements of air monitoring and all of that kind of thing. So they opened up. Uh, they got hit with the oil glut. So they were just storing a lot of oil here instead of refining it. And then they opened up. Uh, they had a couple of uh, incidents where in the oil refinery process, any kind of byproducts uh, uh, or, or you know, overages, they burn off in what's called flares. If you pass by a refinery and you see those flames coming out the towers, that is. But uh, they apparently didn't have their, their towers set up right or monitored right or something. Uh, and it, it just spewed, I mean, it was a huge, huge fireball, and uh, it didn't burn off all of the oil and stuff coming out, so there were sulfur fumes coming out, there were droplets of oil that dropped all over uh, uh, parts of the west side of uh, St. Croix, the west end, where mostly uh, working uh, people and uh, black and Latino people work, uh, and then... Uh, so then uh, the EPA told them they had to bring in air monitors. And the EPA sent a, a team down here uh, in, the, in the process of setting up everything. They had another incident where the same thing happened. So uh, thank goodness uh, there's a different administration because the EPA stepped in and immediately shut down the refinery. And right now it's an open question as to what happens there. Uh, they're, they're, they've already had a brownfield people trying to get with the economic development people to see what will happen with that site if it stays shut down. But right now, we have no idea if it's going to open back up, if it's going to shut down. We do know that uh, uh, every weekend since uh, those incidents have happened, uh, the airport waiting room has been with uh, people who work at the refinery leaving. Uh, they apparently have 500 local people there and 300 contractors, and it appears that most of the contractors are bailing because they have no idea when they're going to be able to continue their work. So it's a big question mark here. Mm -hmm. Lord have mercy. Okay, uh, one of the other communities that Mustafa mentioned earlier was the Native community, Indigenous folks. So since we have Dina here, uh, uh, can you tell us more about how all of this relates to our native population. By the way, the Atlantic had a, a cover story, I guess some people know about that, about uh, proposing that the um, national parks all be turned over to Native Americans. <laughs> so anyway, do you have any thoughts on that and whatever else you want to say? I have a lot of thoughts on that. <laughs> but uh, let me introduce myself first. Yes. Why Peace Nux Seal? He squeezed Dina Gillia Whitaker. Um, I'm a descendant of the Colville Confederated Tribes in Washington State, but I'm coming to you from the traditional and unceded homelands of the Ahashiman Nation in what's currently called Orange County in California. So um, I, I come to this work as somebody who's a journalist and, and a scholar. So, um, so I've been doing this work for quite a long time and I uh, have in my, you know, the sort of the culmination of all of that that work uh, came together in a book that I wrote um, called As Long as Grass Grows, the Indigenous Fight for Environmental Justice from Colonization to Standing Rock. And, uh, and in that work, it was the first book of its kind, and it's been acclaimed that, and, and recognized as such as uh, being a book that makes uh, some pretty uh, a pretty significant intervention into that literature. And in the book, I argue that environmental justice for American Indian people specifically is really different than it is for other EJ communities um, to, to use that language that we use in this work. Um, and the reason that it's different is because uh, for American Indian people, environmental injustice begins with 
genocide and land dispossession. It's about um, the, the, the impulse of the state to erase, to literally eliminate indigenous people. And it does this in uh, countless ways over, uh, over history, over 500 years. And so the, the dispossession, the, the you know, forced expulsion off of lands, um, starving, starvation, you know, into submission to, uh, you know, to, to impose these treaties, give forcing land sessions. Um, uh, you know, those are just the beginning points for Native people. So we really need to understand <clears throat> this history of colonialism, colonial invasion, colonial domination. Uh, and, and the other point to that is that the, this concept of environmental racism for Native people is not broad enough um, because when we look at the broad arc of history, uh, racism is really co-constituted with, with colonialism. And colonialism is always about land. So the, the, the coming to this continent, to t the taking of the land, which results in all these, this cascade of environmentally unjust uh, uh, impacts uh, is is because of the need to get the land and this idea of inferiority that this is what racism is, right? I mean, in its core, racism is, is the, uh, the white European construction of non-white people as inferior in these social Darwinist, uh, scientific racist kind of ways. Um, and so, so it's, but it begins as coming to get the land to, to take it over and ultimately replace the indigenous populations. And, uh, and in that process, race is constructed because we know race is an artificial construction, right? It's not biologically determined, um, but race becomes that which is the logic, the organizing logic um, for the dispossession of native people, for uh, you know, the processes of the transatlantic slave trade, all of these things. We we have to remember that colon, the colonization of land is the condition of possibility for all of that. And so um, we don't and we don't see this in the frameworks of like the EPA or environmental justice law and policy. Uh, the, the framework is and, and the analytic framework is very narrow and uh, for, na for Native people, some of the, the concerns are not just about uh, polluting impacts or, you know, even pipelines. Um, uh, it's about access to, to places that are still culturally uh, central for Native people, especially sacred sites. Um, most, you know, we all know that all of the land in the United States was all Indigenous land. Now Native people only control 5% of it. Um, that means that that all of the rest of that land still contains sites of uh, significant importance culturally and religiously to Native people. So, um, so the a second point is that Native people, these in this framework going beyond environmental uh, racism is understanding that Native people have a very different relationship to the state because we are not ethnic minority groups. We are uh, nations with political relationships to the state, and this fundamentally changes that conversation. Uh, how we talk about these these uh, broad processes of injustice that are environmentally induced. And then thirdly, um, a, a really important piece of this it sort of gestures to what you were saying, Richard, about uh, land back. Part of the reason that we want to have land back, this is not about uh, giving all the land's going to be given back to the Native people. That's not what Native people mean when we say land back. It's not everybody y'all go back where y'all came from. From, it's not that. It's how we can restore indigenous uh, people to these original places that, that they come from. But there are different, many different ways that we can talk about that and imagine that. And one of the primary functions of that is to restore indigenous land management practices onto the land. Because let's face it, uh, what we have today is a result of 
what I would call colonial, uh, industrial colonialism, all the kinds of impacts that black communities face, that low income communities face, other EJ communities face, are a result of this relationship of domination that Europeans had to the land and brought with them. And and forced the, the, the ending of indigenous land management practices that really constructed lives of uh, sustainability for uh, 15,000 and plus years. So, so uh, this, this topic of indigenous knowledge, re restoring indigenous land man pra management practices to the land based on indigenous land ecological knowledge is critically important and it's, and it's uh, important for everybody, not just indigenous people. Right, right. Now, if you can just summarize what you think the uh, uh, journalists need to do when they're covering these issues that, will, that would uh, touch on your points. What would the summary be? The summary is that th that you need to have a, you need to educate yourself about this. Most mm -hmm. people don't really understand these very different uh, these very different um, frameworks and 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 foundations of native existence on the land. Too often we get conflated into this conversation, this framework of racism. So is that which uh, you know native people that that which con constitutes um, the injustices to native people are reduced to racism but it's it's way beyond oh, that yeah. so um so journalists really need to educate themselves a, a, about that you know read the read my book read the the literature on environmental justice coming from native studies scholars um, and native journalists to to understand these much broader implications and um, and and think about the historical processes that um, that shape all of this. Mm -hmm. So it's okay. really it's really educating e educating yourself about these issues. And I would also refer to the Native American Journalists Association for uh, as a source of, uh, to as a beginning place for uh, sourcing uh, some of these these kinds of sources. Great, great, thank you. Okay, anybody want to uh, contribute a question or an observation? All you experts in the room. I, I just wanted to, uh, that's really enlightening. I really, um, what you just said and everything people said earlier than that too. Um, I'm Yannick Rice-Lamb. I teach journalism at Howard University and I work with fierceforblackwomen.com. And I'm working on a series looking at environmental health in Akron, Ohio, where I grew up, looking at the impact of the rubber industry, the former rubber capital of the world. So it's um, running in the, the Center for Public Integrity and in Belt Magazine, which covers the Rust Belt. And um, what I, I was interested because I grew up there and it affected a lot of people I know, including people in my family. And there's high rates of cancer and autoimmune conditions and respiratory problems. So the rubber industry is a shell of its former self, but even though a lot of the companies are gone, a lot of the health impacts are still there, as they are in a lot of places um, around the country and around the world. So that's kind of what um, drew me into looking, looking at that. And there's a Superfund site there um, also that's very contentious as Superfund sites are and uh, a debate over whether it was even cleaned up. So one woman called it mm -hmm. uh, a blue light special in terms of the what they ended up with compared to the original plan to um, clean it up. Okay. So, to the rest of the discussion. Great. Thank question you. For, uh, for Charles. Yes. Uh, and the other environmental advocates. When Lois Gibbs got the Love Canal, uh, got Love Canal uh, as the focus of uh, the original Superfund sites. She complained that environmental groups didn't take uh, grassroots groups very seriously, um, that there was this gulf between what the effects are and what the causes are of, of, of these environmental miseries. Is that gulf being, being, uh, being bridged these days? Do environmentalists and community activists have more, uh, more of a communications link? Yeah, I mean, Mustafa can speak to this as well. I mean, I think, you know, it's been, um, it's been a pretty uh, 
a controversial set of issues or, you know, contentious set of issues, I think is the best, well, better way to say it. And, you know, the uh, from the environmental justice side, um, you know, there's been, a, it, this has been an issue, an ongoing issue that got raised and led to, of course, the first national people call environmental leadership summit. Um, and um, uh, at, I think basically you can say progress is being made a lot more. Uh, it's just beginning to scratch the surface and beginning, uh, there's a lot more that needs to be done. Um, you know, I think the, um, you know, uh, I, I, Lowe's point is very, uh, very astute and is, um, you know, um, in different ways, the same ones that uh, animated the, uh, the, the uh, issues that EJ leaders um, back in the uh, early, uh, early 1990s raised to the mainstream um, national environmental groups. Yeah, I, I would also say that uh, last year, the Just and Equitable Platform uh, came together and was signed between a number of the larger environmental and conservation organizations and frontline leaders. Uh, for there to be better uh, comprehensive work done together to make sure there's better utilization uh, of resources and make sure the resources are actually um, going to make it to frontline organizations. Um, but there's a lot of work that still needs to happen. I mean, there are still huge gaps uh, in the capacity um, that you know, some frontline organizations have that don't have the resources um, and, you know, these other larger organizations that sometimes have hundreds, a hundred million dollar budget. I mean, if you got somebody with a $50,000 budget, somebody with a hundred million dollar budget, of course, there's some disparities there that you have to be mindful of and you have to address in a proper way. Um, and I'll just call this out also that the philanthropic family who is doing a better job also played a role in these disparities um, that existed and created these dynamics because if they had told uh, these larger um, uh, conservation and environmental organizations that you will work in an effective manner with frontline organizations, then that would have changed the dynamics um, because you know many of the organizations were getting their funding from them. So we are in a moment now where people are growing, um, but we still got a long way to go. Can you talk a little bit about just uh, President Trump really attempted to, former President Trump, to roll back a lot of the policies that the EPA had just really undermined a lot of things. Can you bring us up to date about where we are in terms of where we were before Trump was in office? And because there were always the super funds of issues about waterways and things like that that never seemed to be addressed properly. So can you talk about like how far we've gone backwards even in the wake of where we were before? And what's being done about it? And has the Biden administration done anything that we can see that we can people can celebrate? Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> well, Charles works at EPA. I, I'm no longer at EPA. I resigned four years ago, but I, I can follow Charles and I can I can talk to you about what's going on with the Biden administration. Yeah, I mean, you know, um, there's been a lot of progress over the past 25 years on environmental justice. Um, you know, uh, that should, uh, and uh, needs to be recognized. Um, uh, but getting environmental justice integrated into the regulatory process has been really hard and slow. And so, you know, under the Obama administration, I think you could say that um, that, that started to uh, happen in a, in a big way or in a significant way with the development of um, guidance and tools uh, for analysis and uh, integration into areas like rulemaking and permitting and enforcement and things like that. And it was only getting started. Um, and, um, and so with the Trump administration, that really kind of set that back. And under the Trump administration, I will say the fact that we were able to keep the environmental justice program viable was a really big accomplishment. But um, you know, a uh, lot of lot of things uh, were in fact rolled back. I think you could see from um, President Biden's uh, public statements, executive orders, um, as well as some of the uh, decisions recently made that um, you know there is seriousness uh, in all this uh, in terms of addressing uh, environmental justice. 
I'd like to also jump in here and say I'm I'm watching this like a hawk uh, to see you know the 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 discourse about environmental justice has been really pretty front and center coming out of the the Biden Harris team and uh, from what I'm looking from what I'm seeing is that I'm seeing a pretty serious commitment to it I'm seeing it is not really being tokenized but as being a, a, a serious effort to infuse uh, environmental justice discourse um, expertise uh, ev and everything into all aspects of um, the executive branch, um, and not just and and in, and including the appointment of Deb Haaland, uh, a Native woman, to the Secretary of the Interior. This is a huge step, and and it's uh, it, it is a bold step. And you know, Deb Haaland, for there, anybody who knows anything about Deb Haaland, is that is her commitment to the environment and to um, uh, to having a, a, a clean and equitable environment for everybody, not just for Native people. I mean, she did not get elected uh, to represent Native people. She got elected to represent everybody in the district, uh, you know, when she was a congressman, a congresswoman. Um, because of those, because of those really inclusive values. So, uh, you know, I, I totally trust her leadership in this. Um, uh, at, while I simultaneously recognize that, you know, she's working for, um, for the federal government, and she's working within structures, whose logics are based on indigenous elimination. So this is, this is my concern. Um, that doesn't mean to say that she is not able to accomplish accomplish some good things. I think that she will, and I think that she already has, um, but it remains to be seen. And finally, um, the last, what was it last week, the, the Congressional uh, Committee on Natural Resources, which is headed by Raul Grijalva, ha held an oversight hearing on environmental justice in indigenous communities. And that's exactly what it was called. Um, and it was kind of the first time I, I have really ever heard, they, they were very explicit about saying that environmental justice for indigenous people is really different than it is for everybody else. Else. And I I took that to heart, um, and I and I found it really uh, you know uh, stimulating and hopeful um, that they're getting the message now. So uh, yeah, that's just my two cents worth there. Yeah, I'll just say uh, Rochelle has her hand up. Let me. Uh, did you have have a question, a statement, Rochelle? I, I have two questions. Uh, okay. First of all, I, I'm Rochelle Riley, uh, longtime columnist here in Detroit one hour from Flint where many people still do not have clean water and uh, home to Marathon Oil, which operates in the most polluted zip code in Michigan, one of the most polluted in the nation. And I wanna thank Derek for the things that he said because the question, the first question is, are there efforts that anyone's aware of that are trying to make sure that people in the community are working with reporters and calling for coverage that is not being done now because it's being treated as an issue story instead of a quality of life story. And the second question is, are any of these young graduates going into coverage of environmental justice? We have some of the most amazing folks on the panel right here today, but when I talk to these kids, everybody wants to be on TMZ and try to find the stories that make the top of the news and they're not really interested in these issues. And I'm just concerned about the continued need for expertise. So those were my two questions and thank you so much. This is an excellent discussion. Good. Anybody got a comment about that? Um, I think a, a, I see more students at Howard who are interested in, in environmental justice. Um, some of them want to be activists. Some of them do want to cover the issues or do films and documentaries and things like that. But I do think that's um, an area of uh, propose the health and science course to kind of get into that a little bit more. But um, there is a, a movement for that, I think, in some campuses. But I think we do need to encourage more students to to look at that and look at health and science in general. Richard, the, uh, yes. it's, it's great to hear uh, the Biden administration is particularly receptive uh, to a lot of this. But what is there an agenda the activists have about what ought to be, should be done by when, and by which agency and by whom. I, I guess Dina and Mustafa may be the best people to, to address that, uh, certainly in terms of uh, First Nations and, 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 and 
communities of color. Uh, is there a list? Is there something you guys believe this, this administration needs to do? Well, I have a laundry list of things I think they need to do, but let, let's talk about what people have actually put in place. So, um, you know, leading up to this moment, there were numerous frontline organizations and the networks, um, you know, who had shared uh, white papers uh, and other sets of actions that they wanted the administration to be able to move forward on. And now there is a, a structure in place called the WEJAC. Um, and, you know, that is a number of frontline leaders and others uh, who are a part of what you could label as a federal advisory committee um, that is providing advice and recommendations to the Biden administration. And they just, as of, I believe last week, um, submitted uh, their paper or the, uh, one of their initial uh, sets of work to the administration to say, these are the areas that you should be focused on. Here are our sets of ideas and solutions in that space um, that, that, uh, that we hope you will give strong consideration to. Um, so that is a, a formal body um, of folks who've been doing the work for a while and newer voices also. There are some younger folks uh, who are also a part of that. So there's an intergenerational set of individuals um, who are sharing in that space. So uh, I'll let Dina, uh, she may want to chime Can in. Can I I'll just add a few uh, details to this discussion? Uh, please do, please so do. in addition to the... Um, the, uh, the establishment of a White House Environmental Justice Advisory uh, Commit Council. Um, there's going to be um, an all of government uh, approach towards environmental justice. And uh, that uh, is um, reflected in the beginning in the establishment of a White House uh, Interagency Council on Environmental Justice, assisting all the agencies. Uh, a really big uh, initiative um, is um, something called Justice 40 which is um, uh, basically a, a set of climate related as a very broad set of resources. Uh, it stipulates that 40% of those resources uh, need to go to underserved, um, uh, overburdened, disadvantaged communities. Uh, and a tool um, that is gonna help uh, uh, facilitate that is uh, called a uh, climate and just uh, economic justice um, screening tool it is being developed and then lastly, uh, there is a um, serious attempt to revise um, and strengthen the uh, executive order on environmental justice that was uh, uh, issued back in um, uh, 20, 1994 by uh, President Clinton. Of course, there's going to be more, uh, I, I, I believe, but those are the things um, to just give more detail to what uh, Mustafa just said that, are, that is in place. Yeah. And Dean, if you give me one second, I just want to also add that inside of the stimulus bill that was signed, there was $100 million that was dedicated to environmental justice. 50 million of that was supposed to go to monitoring. Um, and then the other 50 million, you know, uh, is going to be utilized in a number of different ways. So that, that's the largest pot of money uh, on the federal side of an equation um, in the 25 plus years that I've been doing this that, that have been dedicated. Um, so that, you know, just helps as folks are moving forward. Okay, I see that Heather Tony is here. Can Dina um, weigh in on that? Uh, all right, one, okay. Uh, yeah, I don't really have that much to add, although I wanted to, uh, and maybe we're going to get to this at some point, but talk about some of the stuff that states are doing as well. Um, so, you know, talking, you know, going beyond the, the, the federal, uh, the, the federal um, landscape on this, um, they're, they're, you know, the, I'm not sure what all other states are doing. I know in California, um, where I'm at, there has been uh, a, um, an ongoing effort to uh, to attend to environmental justice issues. I, you know, the California Coastal Commission is, which is said to be the most powerful land use body in the United States, if not the world, um, has worked uh, diligently in the last few years to um, adopt an environmental justice policy platform. And in that, they adopted a tribal environmental justice policy um, platform 
term specific to tribal nations, which is, I find really uh, powerful. And they also just, uh, coming out of the governor's office just um, six months ago in September, issued um, uh, what's being called a tribal land back policy. Um, and so that's, that's also very interesting. And I, you know, I want to keep my eyes open to uh, whatever states might be doing something like that. You know, one of the things that I've been doing um, past several years is to really track and help promote environmental justice at the state level. And, um, you know, in addition to the things that Dina said, um, uh, there's been pretty significant progress on state uh, environmental justice at, at, the at the states, including the passage of multiple and more and more uh, environmental justice laws. Um, so that's a very, very significant. I mean, I think the first area um, is, you know, developing of mapping tools that are look at uh, these impacts cumulatively. And so therefore, um, and, um, and the first of that is count viral screen. And of course, EPA has its own um, EJ screen and, you know, they're actually uh, come, come together and being used together. But Illinois passed one. Um, also, I saw in California, the, the use of that uh, was through something called Senate Bill 535, which uh, mandated that 25% of the greenhouse gas reduction fund resources go to disadvantaged communities. That has resulted now in the billions of dollars going there. So this is a really different in terms of resources, um, not just small grants as before, but now real programmatic resources of scale. So that's a very important thing. Illinois has something from, called the Future Energy Shop Act. Um, and so, um, and then uh, New York State has the Climate uh, 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 Leadership and Environmental Community Protection Act, which stipulates 40%. The arc that uh, connects this is Justice 40. And now these are the things that inform Justice 40. The other area um, uh, that's really uh, uh, big um, is in terms of cumulative risk and uh, cumulative impacts, addressing cumulative impacts and permitting. So California, Minnesota, and New Jersey, which is really strong, uh, the strongest version of that has passed legislation. And that, that's really very significant. There are many programs um, that are start ha happening, uh, a lot of which are more community-based, like the, um, you know, California's Community Air Protection Act. Um, and uh, uh, California also has something called the Human Right to Water Act. And, you know, it's followed up with that with uh, something um, called the a Safe and Affordable Drinking Water Fund. Um, uh, and we can go on, but you can see now that these are really uh, significant changes. I think, uh, I always make the point, these are not changes just in terms of the nature of, uh, in terms of environmental justice, but actually contributions to changing the, um, to changing environmental law. Uh, and so they're very significant, I think. I okay, think I wanted to get Heather in uh, before she she has to leave. Um, Heather, would you tell us uh, first of all who you are, and then we were talking earlier about how a lot of environmental issues aren't really thought of as environmental issues, such as the concept of heat zones, um, where you well you can explain what heat zones are, but it's an urban phenomenon, and that we don't really think of as an environmental issue. So can you talk about that? And then Derek Jackson has a question for you. So sure, take it away. Sure. <laughs> well, thanks so much. And, and it's, it's wonderful to be here with all of you, many who I have worked with before. And it, it's always great to, to get a chance to have this conversation. And I guess the best place to start is, you know, the fact that uh, echoing on what many of you have already said, you know, I didn't see myself as an environmentalist. I came to this work as what I call a recovering politician. Uh, I was a mayor when I started doing environmental. And it was Lisa Jackson who basically explained to me that I was doing environmental work and had been doing so all of my life. Um, I was a mayor in Greenville, Mississippi, and then later served as the regional administrator for EPA in the Southeast um, under President Obama and administrator uh, Gina McCarthy. And, you know, what I found, I think, you know, Richard, you said earlier, connecting the dots is the right. most important thing around the storytelling. Not to see yourself is indicative of how you see environmental work. And I realized that if there was any group of people, um, no offense to any other group of people, but if there is any other group of people um, that is the epitome of resiliency, um, as African-Americans, enslaved Africans who were moved from one ecosystem that they knew 
transplanted in a very traumatic way to an entirely different ecosystem where they not only thrive, but taught people from another ecosystem how to plant and grow and live, we have resiliency growing within our veins, flowing quite literally within our veins. We have done so throughout the years, but have not had the benefit culturally competent solutions with the broader audience. And that's because we haven't seen ourselves in this. And so I think of right now, like two stories. <laughs> One of the story that came out of the Atlantic about a week and a half ago, talking about the connection between slavery and petrochemical facilities across the Gulf of Mexico. And it was an interesting story to me because I think, um, I don't know if it was my good buddy Mustafa who said this before, or Valdo, who I, I love his work with Media Matters. The fact that the conversation came through the lens of Black people as victimization, but the experts were white people uh, in universities out of Virginia and other places. It was someone else telling the story as the experts, when in all actuality, we have been the experts in these spaces for generations. So we have to do a better job of telling our story. The second one I cannot wait to read, and I'm so hopeful that it's going to come, is this is the 100th year of Tulsa of the Tulsa massacre of the Greenwood district. And I was there earlier this year and it just baffled me how as we even discuss right now, air pollution and toxic chemicals within our community, Tulsa Greenwood district was rebuilt with a uh, interstate on one side bordering a, a railway on the other side. So quite literally the epitome of air pollution covering a black community continuing into, um, into today's society. Where and how are we talking about this? The, the final, I think, thing that uh, uh, when thinking about heat zones and thinking about how we talk about climate, particularly in African-American community, we want to, instead of putting it in the box, recognize that climate and environment is actually the table that all the boxes sit on. So every single issue, social justice issue that you can imagine, whether it's economy, whether it is education, whether it is voter suppression, it all connects back to the environment. So when we were talking about, uh, Richard, you and I were talking about heat islands. Uh, I'm, I'm here in Mississippi, but you know, everybody in Mississippi has family in Chicago, right? That's North Mississippi. <laughs> think about Chicago and think about how historically and systemically um, the housing projects were developed based upon historic and systemic how, racial uh, racist housing policy. You can see very clearly how you have concrete buildings, entire zones that are um, made just to encapsulate heat. Uh, where we have increased, uh, as we have increased global warming, we have increased temperatures across this country. These are spaces where it is going to be hotter than other places. And it's not the fault of the people who live there, but the systemic policies that have been put in place that have put us there. And so we're thinking through what are the solutions to this. Uh, I stress that these stories have to be told for this reason. Dollars follow the coverage. When Mustafa was talking about philanthropy and how people give and the capacity of some of the environmental justice and frontline, fence line organizations, they receive funding. We all receive funding and I work for a major big green organization, okay? Um, it's when those donors read the stories, they are moved to take an action, but who writes the story and the way that the story is written clearly determines how and where they put their money. We are in the process of rebuilding trust with frontline organizations and rebuilding trust because science tells us we don't have a long time to do this. The International Panel on Climate Change has not changed their clock back. They are continuing to move in the direction that tells us we have a shorter amount of time. And so on the science and fact side, big green organizations have figured out not only do we need to look at justice because we've not done that correctly in the past and we need to right some wrongs, but we really don't have time to be divided. We literally have a very short window to all come together and work on this. But the stories are not being told in a way that shows the expertise and value of people on the front lines. The dollars don't follow. So the importance here is making sure that as we are telling these stories, we are putting it in the light and showing the value, again, to the people who are on the front lines of this work, that they should get the capacity and the dollars to do the work, that it should come directly to them. 
I can't tell you how many times I've been on the phone with folks who are literally going from a White House meeting to the city council meeting over to their garage to have the neighborhood meeting and trying to link up online to have a conversation with a donor who wants to send them in, wants them to send in a paper to talk about why they need $50,000. Nobody has time for all that. They're out here doing the work. But when we don't have the stories that are showing these issues and the capacity that's necessary, it creates a cycle. So we've got to do this. We've got to do it in a way that is honest, is authentic, and allows these dollars to flow to the people who need them. And then last point, we have to do it in a way that is helpful on a global scale. Because I can assure you, for every major company that is polluting in the United States, they're doing the same thing in Nigeria. They're doing the same thing off the coast of South Africa. They're doing the same thing in places where human rights issues have been issues for years and are part of that, our diaspora. So if we're going to say that it's not correct here, we have an, uh, an a obligation to hold corporations accountable across the globe. And if there's anybody who can do that and do that well, I think it starts with us. Here, here. But Miss Tony, could I ask her a quick question? I mean, it's like a three ring circus. I mean, you have Michael Reagan and EPA. I, you know, what is his clear agenda? Number one, the big green like Sierra Club, they got their things. You can't get people to return phone calls. And then the thing thing, you still have the Trumpites and the Kuna folks talking about coal should be back and the Rust Belt. And so you have journalists running around like from Annie's to Bernie's. So my question is like, I think um, Ken Walker says someone, there is, and you always said it, it's not a clear agenda and folks are all over the place. And so my point is, has there been a real sophisticated meeting in the last six months where you talk to Regan, this is where we're going. You got the, the big green folks, they're doing their thing and people don't even like to return phone calls. So I'm just kind of curious at the poor journalists who are trying, you know, what, what are you guys doing to kind of come together so we can get a clear message out? Yeah, I think that's a really good point um, and, a, and a good way to sort of maybe think of it in a different lens. The, the Biden administration has talked about this all of government approach. I think of an all of community approach. So even in having conversations with journalists, with having conversations with elected officials, I never just sit in one issue. I want to know what is the hot issue that's being talked about in your particular area community, and I'm going to wrap climate into that. The other thing I think is important is we, we've left out a group. And... Um, even despite all that the, the Trump administration did in the past and all the Biden administration is trying to, to, to uh, keep going with, um, we, Dina said it, and I'm, I wanna follow up on it. You know, our governors and mayors stayed on the front line. They did not drop out of this fight. They did not say, okay, we're not gonna do anything since we have a new federal administration. So there were some significant moves that mayors made. In fact, climate mayors, for example, is a whole group that came out um, at, at the end of the Obama administration, beginning of the uh, Trump administration, the entire we're all in movement uh, started. You've got Mayor Sylvester. Um, I'm just so used to calling him Sylvester. Y'all can tell him a for former mayor. Uh, that's out of Houston, <laughs> um, who is actually the chair of climate mayors. You have an African-American mayor that's the chair of climate mayors in a part of the country that is most impacted by climate and environmental issues. We have to call on people who are at every level of government to engage in this conversation. And so I say, you know, I, I, I get it. I've, I've been an elected official. I understand that it's a lot of craziness going on, but I refuse to say that that is the end all be all. Um, I wanna talk to the planning directors in cities. I wanna talk to the sustainability people. I wanna talk to the wastewater management folks. I wanna talk to the people who are implementing the policy to A, know what they have already done, and number two, what are they planning to do? Because that is where the rubber hits the road. So even right now, even if you're not getting those callbacks from EPA, go to the city, find out what the city is preparing to do with the money that is anticipated to come than anybody can tell you on a federal level. That's going to tell you where dollars are going to be spent. It's going to tell you what jobs are going to be created. And it's going to get your readership involved because it lets them know what impacts them right now today. It's those five physical senses of what can I see, taste, touch, smell, hear, and that how that impacts my, my pocketbook, how it impacts my family that I want to know about. And that's how we get people engaged and saying, oh, this is the right thing to do versus, no, nah, I think they're going the wrong way on that. Start local, build up, and that's how you get the attention. Richard, I have hey, a question. Well, wait, 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 hold on just one second. Uh, Derek had a question for you. 
Heather, and uh, anyone else who wanted to ask, answer? I have a question as well. Okay. Uh, yeah. Go ahead, go ahead, Derek. Sure. Um, Heather, Mustafa, uh, Charles, uh, Dina, whoever wants to answer. Uh, Peril, and yet another aspect of uh, EJ that the Biden administration has waded into is a $20 billion proposal to, quote, reconnect communities torn apart by highways, uh, mm. the highway building of the last mid century. And uh, not, you know, and of course, we know that many, almost every city in America was affected by that. The black community in almost every city was affected by that on top of the fact that those communities were already living with uh, a, a overburdens of pollution. So they over, overburdens of pollution plus being sliced up and having culture and businesses destroyed. I'm just curious, how serious do you think that piece of the proposal is? And how do you connect it if you do connect it to all these other efforts on clean air and all that kind of stuff? Mitchell take on it. <laughs> Whoever wants to answer. Um, real fast, you know, I, I get it. We've definitely had a lot of division, but I think we also have to think um, in a way that is resilient and sustainable moving forward. So taking the science, Derek, you know, looking at where are these, um, even getting, getting down to the city level, where are the highways we're talking about? Where are the zones of most extreme weather and climate. The last I looked at it, you know, last week, you can just sort of layer the climate maps for the next 100 years. And you see the Southeast is certainly right in the pathway. It's where you have more African-Americans. It's where you have more impoverished communities. And that line of the jet stream just goes right around, around that way. So I would want to be very strategic in talking about how we go about correcting this, how much time it's going to take and how that layers into the overall goal of not, not only achieving, uh, reducing global emissions, but creating jobs and creating resilient communities. What I don't wanna see happen is this idea of, um, of oh, oh um, where you have, I can't, I can't gentrification, green gentrification, right? You have these spaces and areas where now all of a sudden you have people of color who have been not only economically depressed, but had already been divided. We shake, we shake it up again, change and move more land. And now we have a whole nother level of green gentrification and displacement. So I think there has to be a lot of thought, intent put into this, but also planning. It takes years to do these projects. Yeah, that, yeah, yeah. Yeah, okay, a lot but, of people made that uh, comment that they're, they're very concerned that it's got to be done just right. Uh, otherwise, you just refuel, you just you just make it more attractive and push everybody out who was supposed to benefit. Well, you got to put it in perspective also. So the number is too small. It's a it's a good first step, but it's too small. And here's why it's too small. There are 164,000 miles of highways in our country. There are 4 million miles of roadways because, you know, they cross over all the time in different directions. So when you understand that and then you overlay it with some of the things that Heather just shared, then you understand the complexity of the problem. And the question is, when we talk about reconnecting communities together, are you talking about taking highways out of where they've traditionally, where you put them um, and moving them considerable distances around so there's no longer the impacts of communities? If you're talking about actually really reconnecting communities, then are we talking about a 21st century reconnection or are we talking a 20th century reconnection? Because if it's a 21st century reconnection, then we're also talking about and bringing into the mix, how will EVs play a more effective role? How are these electric vehicles, uh, whether we're talking about buses or trains or a number of the other types of things that are gonna move people are gonna be a part of the mix so that we don't continue to have impacts inside of our communities, one, and two, how do we actually build wealth inside of our communities? So it is not just about uh, redirecting roads. It is about, will there be black ownership of these new sets of roads and highways that are gonna be in place? Is there gonna be black and brown uh, and indigenous ownership of the businesses that will be, need to be created around EVs and other types of electrical vehicle technologies? So we have to stop thinking about just the Band-Aid types of things. And if we're talking about making serious transformational change inside of our communities, all that has to come into the mix. Here, here. Okay, I'm gonna take a slight detour here. We, we wanna to toast uh, 
uh, brother Bats here, who is, uh, is going to become the, uh, the new dean at the uh, Cronkite School of Journalism and Arizona State. And uh, we want to congratulate him and toast him. But we also want to ask him how what he's heard today is going to affect what he's teaching these journalism students. <laughs> so first, first, let's raise a glass and congratulate Atendo L. Bats Jr. as the new dean of the Cronkite School at Arizona State. Congratulations. OK. Now, for the question, what are you going to do about all this? <laughs> well, first of all, I just, I just want to uh, thank you, Richard, for inviting me on uh, to be with this esteemed group today. I see a lot of faces and names who I know, people whose work I've, I've read and followed over the course of my career. So I just uh, want to just thank you for the opportunity to be amongst you uh, today. Uh, what I will say is that all of the issues that we've talked about today are of, you know, you know, high interest uh, to, to me and to, you know, all the journalists here. And I think that, you know, as I've been following the chat on uh, Facebook as well, and, and at the Cronkite School, we are interested in, you know, environmental justice and covering, covering those issues as, as it pertains to, you know, communities of color and underserved communities and making sure that all the issues, you know, get, get exposed and that we have you know, equality, you know, in our, in our reporting and that we're preparing the students to go out into uh, communities and go into their careers with an awareness of what the issues are. And so, you know, I would say that this is something that I'm very interested in, have been interested in, and so that, you know, look to carry this, you know, into the role as we, you know, look to increase the, you know, what we're doing at the Cronkite School and always being a, a leader and at the forefront of journalism and journalism education. Excellent, excellent. All right, now I got have a question that I was that, that that came before the meeting, so I will just uh, read that to you. I'd like to hear his insights into DEI issues, which we all know, diversity, equality, and uh, inclusion, uh, or equity rather, and inclusion issues at communication schools, student recruitment and admissions, and faculty hiring and promotion. Where is Cronkite compared to its peers on DEI and who does he see as the school's peers? Does he see any successful models among communication schools or in broader academia? Well, I thought I already, well, I feel like I'm being interviewed again here. All right. Uh, this all is right. just one question, go ahead. <laughs> you know, being a dean is always being in the hot seat. Did you yeah, know it that? Is. <laughs> it is. So what I will say is, is that, you know, there's always, you know, we are, you know, as I, you know, looked at this uh, tremendous opportunity with the Cronkite School, one of the things that I was interested in is what is the approach to diversity, equity, and inclusion? And what I will also say is uh, empowerment and creating a sense of belonging uh, for the students and the faculty and anyone who has the opportunity to interface uh, with the Cronkite School. And I think that, you know, it's something that you can never sit back and say, okay, we fixed it, it's, it's done. But, but is there a process of continuous Im improvement? Is there a process of analyzing where we are? How can we do better? How can we bring more voices uh, to the table and to create a more inclusive environment? So what I will say is, is, is that there is obviously um, a, you know, a format and an infrastructure for that uh, in place uh, at the Cronkite School and at a greater ASU. And it's something that we're really looking to continue to build out. And I look forward to participating in that process with my colleagues there uh, at the university. Uh, looking at, you know, on a broader sense, you know, there's a lot of, you know, where we are right now in society and this particular point in time, a lot of universities are paying very close attention to diversity, equity, and inclusion. And uh, without really calling out, you know, names of particular universities, because I don't want to leave anyone out, but I would say that there are a lot of great examples that we can pull from and look at and collaborate with. I'm very interested in collaboration, uh, working with other, other institutions that have you know, skill sets and expertise uh, under their roof that may align with what we're trying to do at the Cronkite School and that we can create partnerships that we can go at this together and that we, you know, there are gonna be things that, you know, that obviously that we you know, have, have maybe have expanded expertise on, but we, you know, we all must unite around this mission and where can we form effective partnerships uh, to get more done. 
And that's, that's really, you know, what I'm looking to do. And, you know, because of some relationships that I've had, I had coming into my current role at the Scripps Howard Foundation and some relationships that I've been able to build over the course of the past five and a half years uh, with other institutions and really leveraging those partnerships uh, to, to again, uh, bring that to the Cronkite School and the greater uh, academic community and the journalism community as a whole. Excellent. Okay, thank you. Thank you. All right, some people have their hands up. So let me go to Rochelle and then Lynn and then Hazel and then Dina. Uh, thank you. I have a simpler question this time around. So okay. I have seen in the chat these amazing stories, and I have also uh, heard some mentioned. And I can guarantee you that many of the people that I used to write about and that I represent now have not read them. Is there a way to get this work that the environmental journalists are doing in front of more people, whether that's a mission for journalism or whether something exists that we can help share? Okay, anybody got an answer for that? I know there are a few environmental groups that do um, that do connect. There's Climate Matters. Um, I, I know I've done a, a climate masterclass for them. I believe Mustafa has as well. Um, there is the Society of Environmental Journalists. Um, there, there are a couple that sort of are, col are collecting the information and stories and sharing. In fact, I know the Society of Environmental Journalists is doing their, their first- yeah, the, the president, by the way, was just here, but had to leave. Yeah, so, okay, so, okay. You know, I'm familiar okay. with the work that they do, but I'm talking about a place for the common man where we can literally tell folks with the NAACP and the 19 groups that are fighting for justice here, be sure and read what's happening. Right. Uh -oh. That's not here. <laughs> <laughs> well, we have the black press, uh, Denise. Do we, wouldn't that be one vehicle? <laughs> Definitely. <laughs> I mean, that's that's why we do a sustainability or environmental uh, issue every year and try to keep those stories going. So, you know, that's why I really wanted to be here to to kind of see what we're missing and what more we could be doing. Thank and you. Denise is publisher of the Washington Informer. I'll give you a call. I think that may be something the Black press can do. I'm talking something that's like a weekly feature or something where you have a regular look at what people are writing about that affects people's lives. So thank you so much. It's a necessity. Thanks. Okay, Lynn. Well, I'm, I'm somewhat hesitant to do this in front of my, some of my main competitors like Dean Bat and, uh, and Janet. Um, but uh, as many of you know, I do a summer capstone program for the uh, for the Newhouse School where the graduates in broadcast and digital journalism come to Washington for six weeks and cover uh, issues in Congress for specific local television stations in the Newhouse, I mean, in the uh, Next Star group. Um, we're taking different approaches to how we're doing this this summer. They're actually going to be here. We were uh, virtual last summer. And we're assigning a we're assigning a topic a week as opposed to the students just coming up with their own topics for the time they're here. And one of the topics we had decided that we we're going to do is the environment. It's challenging because during their work on campus, doing all of their work towards their master's degree, there's not a specific focus on environmental coverage. And when you add on top of it the idea that they need to figure out how to cover events in Washington and make them salient to the audiences for the various local stations they're covering, it becomes even harder. I've listened to people talk about the importance of focusing on local, what's happening locally, what's happening with the Biden EPA, what's happening at the state level, what the governors, et cetera, are doing. So all my request is I'm going to throw out my email address out there and y'all hit me up with ideas. The students will get here in July and uh, there probably won't be the first week when they start working on these environmental issues, but that would be my way of introducing them to the idea of how you connect the dots. Uh, out of this group of nine reporters coming in, five are African-American. And the idea of just introducing them and requiring to them to think about that will be important. And the hope is that when they go into their first jobs, then they will carry that knowledge and that experience with them. So I'll just put that out there and y'all help. Hey, okay, Ivan, go ahead. I just wanna briefly plug a new network for environmental journalists of color called the Uproot Project. And its mission is to oh, bring yes. diverse uh, voices to the forefront. And they wanna work with students and other uh, journalists of color to help them promote their stories, get their stories placed. I put the link in the chat. So please feel free to 
direct anybody to that. And I think it's a good new network for young and current journalists of color. Thank you. All right, Hazel. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, over my past 35 years of working in, uh, in the Black press specifically, I have done numerous stories on environmental racism. And um, uh, I have a question, but just a couple of things about my background. I have um, specialized in picking up on those stories that come from real people. I mean, like in, in uh, a long time ago, there was a toxic, there was actually a waste dump that had been uh, near Gilpin Court, which was the oldie, oldest housing complex in Richmond, Virginia for more than 40 years. And it was growing bigger and bigger and rats and everything was invading the neighborhood where neighborhoods where people were, children were trying to play. Uh, I think I won an NNPA national award for that story. Um, those, those kinds of shoe leather reporting stories from just listening to people's stories are some of what I think maybe um, reporters might be missing. It's not all about listening to uh, or finding out from the organizations what's going on, but actually um, listening to what's going on in neighborhoods. There was a whole complex one time built on top of a, a toxic, on top of a, a, a dump that had been buried and the, the, the houses began to fall apart and had to be torn down. That was another story. Uh -huh. um, these were out of Richmond, Virginia. And um, most recently though, since I've begun to cover on a national level through my newswire and also through NNPA News Service when I was there, uh, I wrote a story in 2019. It was called Environmental Racism Grows as Environmental Groups Turn Increasingly White. So that brings me to my question and that is, uh, where are the Damu Smiths? And anybody who's serious about this issue knows who Damu Smith is. That's right. And so, you know, Damu passed away um, some years ago, and he was the founder of the National Black Environmental Justice Network. Although we need to be on top of it ourselves as journalists, as, you know, going out into the communities and finding out what's happening. Uh, I think this sort of speaks to Rochelle's issue too. She had Rochelle Raleigh had just spoken up and asked, you know, who, you know, who is actually championing this cause that we can hear on a regular basis? And so, is there a Damu Smith? Does that organization still exist um, in really speaking to environmental racism issues? And are there others? You want me to answer that? Yes. Well, Damu was one of my mentors. So oh, the, the National Black Environmental Justice Network actually um, came back into being um, last year, toward the latter oh. part of last year. So you've got folks like uh, Dr. Beverly Wright and Dr. Bob Bullard. You got Donnell Wilkins, you got Peggy Shepard. You got a whole laundry list of the early foundational leaders who are part of that. Um, and, and Damu lives, he lives in all yes. kinds of young people Yes. Um, whom he made contributions that then made its way to them. Um, so you see all these incredible young leaders that are out there and they may not necessarily always be working for an environmental justice organization per se, but they're working in climate organizations and a number of others and inside of EJ organizations. So uh, he lives uh, and, his, and his investments um, have, are bearing fruit in lots of different places. I just wanna also share with folks. Thank you. Um, oh, most definitely, and thank you for raising his name. The, the, the other thing I wanna share with folks is there's an incredible set of transformational stories of how communities, even though they were impacted, have made change. And we never see these. And some of these stories uh, um, are, the projects that these folks have done are larger than any white organization has ever done. So you've got, I'll just real quickly, in the next 15 seconds. You've got the Spartanburg uh, Regenesis Project taking a $20,000 grant, leveraging $300 million in change, led by black folks. You got the work that's going on in Turkey Creek, Mississippi by Derek Evans, who's leveraged $20 million and what used to be a Freedman community down there. You've got uh, the work that, uh, that is going on or has gone on by Floyd Flake in the faith-based context, Buster Soros, uh, or the folks over there in New Bethel, uh, also in, Sh in Chicago. You've got the work of Miss Margaret May in Kansas City in the Ivanhoe community. Um, so those are just a few quick examples of folks who are making transformative change but never get the spotlight. 
Now the Regenesis Project has to a degree because now this administration is looking at it. But I share that to say that we have a responsibility. If the other folks in media, may, for whatever decision, they made not to highlight these, these projects that are addressing multitudes of sets of issues, housing, transportation, healthcare, job creation, the environment, I can go on and on and on, then we have to highlight them and we have to continually continue to do it um, so that folks see that there is a North Star and we are a part of that North Star. And of course, there are a number of indigenous examples also that I could um, call out also, but Dina can probably give you 500 of them where I can give you 50. But how can how can journalists best find out about these? Well, you have to talk to those environmental justice leaders. The networks are there. So it's just like when young people, I work with thousands of young people, when they ask me that question, and I mean this in the most respectful way to my elders. <laughs> do some reporting, huh? All you gotta do is call to the to the networks uh, and, and say, hey, you know, what are your top three sets of challenges, but what are also your top three sets of transformational work that's happening? And they'll give it to you. And then you but, unpack it and do what you do, um, you know, with that beautiful gift that God has given you. But, but Mustafa, something's wrong. I don't want to be the skunk in the room. I'm sorry. I work for the Washington Forum and Hazel and everybody else. But I'm sorry. I in Baltimore, I it's the police thing. It's the you know, all the Black Lives Matter. But I never see you all within the panoply of the the kibosh to talk about the environmental aspect of things. I know you know these people, but it's almost like a cocktail party issue and I can't get some, and people are arrogant and turning calls and stuff. Right. And my thing is, and even down in, in Arizona right now, they still having this, this uh, whole thing with the count and the votes and stuff and nobody returns phone calls. Not the Republicans, not the Democrats. And they act like you're stupid when you call and say, well, can you tell me what the vote is now? So that's why you for Dean Bats, you know, it's only 500,000 people counted out of 2.1 million. But again, we're, these editors right now need stories today. And, I, and I'm gonna go off, but I guess I just did. <laughs> I can recall, maybe you could put your email there yeah. and you're the activist, but I'm sorry, I don't see the groundswell of stuff. Well, Mustafa, uh, do you mind if, go ahead, Mustafa, I wanna follow you, this is really important. Yeah. I was going to say, you know, I've worked with over 200 reporters. So if you call me, even though I only sleep four hours a day, I try, and especially for reporters of color, because for years, you know, we were hoping that more folks would get the opportunity to do stories in this space. But, you know, in the environmental justice movement, it's not about one person. So I can link you up with a number of girls. Good. I know I see you about to go off, but she's yeah. good. So we better come yeah. on now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and then I'll just say, too, I want to give a shout out to Roland, to Roland Martin, yeah. because Roland has me on every week. And whenever I get the opportunity, I highlight what's going on in our communities in a multitude of ways, because we can't just get locked into this environmental box. I hope you take that away from what right. folks are sharing. When we talk about the environment, we're talking about where you work, play, go to school, a number of other types of things. So when we have that as our intersection points, I think it gives us a much better opportunity. Let me share this with y'all. Here's my phone number. Because yeah. I believe in real talk. It's 202-321-1121. 202-321-1121. Of course, you can always get me at MustafaSantiagoAli.com. But there are all kinds of great folks. So I don't want the spotlight because I've always tried to put the spotlight on the community and the folks who are out there grinding it each and every day. Thank you, Mustafa. Okay, Caroline and then Dina. Thank you. Um, I'm Caroline Brewer. I am the Director of Marketing, Communications, and Media for the Audubon Naturalist Society, which is based in Chevy Chase, Maryland. For the last four years, I have been the chairwoman of the Taking Nature Black Conference, which exists only to elevate the stories of Black, black environmentalists. And we have been fortunate, uh, often because of my relationship uh, with black journalists. I'm a former editorial writer and columnist, which is why I'm a part of Richard's Roundtable, um, to receive coverage for the conference. I put my email address in the chat and the link to the Taking Nature Black uh, webpage. We, what I can tell you, uh, and, and especially in answer to Hamil's question, the reason why you don't see more black environmentalists talking about these issues is because so many of the people doing the work are doing it as I think Heather spoke to, you know, in their garage, in their basement, they are one woman and one man 
bands. Um, it, uh, Mustafa mentioned um, Derek Evans, who had a feature uh, documentary done on him more than 20 years ago. People are still watching that documentary, amazed at what he was able to do without an office, <laughs> without staff, volunteer community of mostly, mostly low income and many elderly uh, black people in Turkey Creek, Mississippi. So for the past four years, we have had more than a hundred black environmentalists working in every environmental discipline you can imagine, uh, working on oceans, working on rivers, working in forests, working in um, uh, uh, forestry, uh, just every discipline that you can imagine. And, and all of those people and their bios are on our, our website. I would be happy to connect you with any one of them. We have videos from every conference that are on there so you can see people speaking to these issues. Mustafa has graced us with his presence every single year. Um, he is uh, just an ardent supporter of, of the work of this conference and of every black environmentalist. So, and he is <laughs> difficult to reach because he's really busy, but he is entirely responsive. So. Um, the people are there. They just don't have the resources. It's just like every other um, black grassroots organization. Their resources pale in comparison to the resources of these so-called big greens, but the work they are doing is phenomenal. Every stone you turn over, you are gonna find people doing work that will blow your mind um, and often for no compensation. Okay, all right, Dina. Oh, okay, thank you. Um, so I wanted to go back and shift gears a, a, a little bit here and go back to what Mustafa was saying about transportation uh, mm -hmm. and, how, and and the re you know making of um, uh, inner cities, inner inner you know, urban communities, but uh, but also to talk about um, uh, you know so called green capitalism and and how journalists need to really be paying attention to uh, gr to green energy and um, the kinds of uh, technology that were being sold right now um, collectively, um, especially around, uh, you know, EVs and uh, elect electric vehicles and hybrid, you know, vehicles and things like that, um, that require battery technology. Um, the, uh, I don't know how many people are paying attention to lithium mining, but this is uh, uh, something that's looming on the horizon. There is a lithium mine planned for Northern Nevada. Uh, in um, the homelands of the Paiute Shoshone people. Uh, it's uh, lithium mining, mine. of course, lithium is a required ingredient in battery technology. And, um, and so there's, uh, there's a, this massive mine, lithium mining is hugely, has huge impacts on the environment. Uh, and this is something just we need to pay attention to. The, the Paiute Shoshone people of Fort McDermott have registered their descent to this, as have local ranching communities and environmental communities. So uh, while we're thinking about environmental justice in urban communities, we also need to be paying attention to the way uh, these things are being played out in, uh, you know, away from the gaze of, uh, of large populations uh, and in the name of, of green capitalism and sustainable energy and everything like that. So uh, be paying attention to that. Look, we had, uh, you know, um, we saw the the overthrow uh, a coup against an indigenous president two years ago, Evo Morales in Bolivia, uh, a democratically very popular elected uh, president, and uh, we saw an American ba backed American backed coup um, against that that uh, leadership. Um, and, and it turns out that Bolivia has the largest lithium deposit in the world. Uh, and because they had nationalized that resource, um, this was a, a reason for, for uh, them to be targeted. Uh, and Elon Musk you know, sent out this very cryptic, it wasn't even cryptic, it was a very straightforward uh, tweet um, about, you know, we will uh, coup against whoever we want. So, um, so we need to really be paying attention to um, to this new technology and the ways that it will reinscribe, uh, you know, the the usual problems that we've all been exposed to. Mm, okay. All right, Yvonne Roman had a question. Okay. Um, how you doing? Um, 
Hi, my name is Ivan Roman. I'm former executive director of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists. I'm from Puerto Rico, and we have several, you know, Puerto Rico, like many islands of the Caribbean and other places, have many, many, many issues that are environmental issues, including, you know, droughts and burning landfills that are filled, and we have to burn the ashes, and we can't dump the ashes, so we export them to Florida. I mean, we have all these other matters. But one of the, most of the recent, we also have a recent outrage of these Bitcoin guys who are moving to Puerto Rico and then doing all kinds of stuff like driving huge, I don't know what you call them, motorcycles or whatever over the over turtle nests, um, over the protected turtle nest areas and all kinds of stuff like that. But one of the things that right now that a lot of people are talking about in Puerto Rico has to do with the electrical grid in Puerto Rico that was destroyed as a result of Hurricane Maria. I mean, yeah, Hurricane Maria and how to re rebuild it and reconstruct it. The, um, there's a clash. Puerto Rico was play, basically the, the federal government. Puerto Rico was bankrupt and the federal government um, established a fiscal control board that basically overrides the governor and everything that has to do with the budget and everything, everything really in Puerto Rico. And right now they're going through a, a process where they've established a public private partnership, the physical control board did to reconstruct the elect to basically stabilize and reconstruct the electrical grid. Grid. There was some clashes between the environmentalists who wanted the reconstruction to happen with more with less fossil fuels, more solar energy, more renewable energy, and the company that was hired that was resisting some of that. Now the company has said that they will, you know, focus on in the future using more solar panels, renewable energy, and other, other things which have been successful in other parts of the island. And I wanted to know if the EPA, I guess this is for Charles Lee, if the EPA is involved in this, uh, in this controversy, um, and will, would the EPA be involved in monitoring what happens now with that reconstruction of the electrical grid in Puerto Rico? I can't give you the details on that, but uh, I can make sure we follow up with you. Uh, that's for sure. Uh, I know there's a lot of activities around um, reconstruction and re uh, you know, um, uh, rebuilding in Puerto Rico. So, um, and, but I don't know for sure the specifics, uh, but I can make sure that we can get back to you on that. Uh, let me make sure I get your name and everything too. Okay. I, I, the chat I also, please. I'll, I'll send it to you in the chat, uh, Mr. That's Lee. great. But there was some, um, I mentioned this area because after, when all of this is being discussed, other territories of the United States have also brought up this issue of how to make their electrical grid more resilient and other environmental issues surrounding the issues of electricity and fossil fuels. And so it's become kind of like a, a call for the U.S. to do something about this issue in, its, in all its territories, not just Puerto Rico. Okay. So, all right. Before can I, can I jump in real quick? All right. Um, so I just wanted you to know that there is an initiative called Our Power Puerto Rico um, that has a number of environmental justice organizations. The Climate Justice Alliance has been a part of that. Um, so they are focused on that issue and a number of other issues there. Um, everything from what's going on in Vieques um, to mm. Old San Juan. Um, mm. Part of my family is from there. So I can link you up with some of the folks who are doing work in that space. And the thing that I'd like to point out is in, uh, people have talked about how to get these stories before and how the press could be involved in getting these stories before the public. In Puerto Rico, we have the, I guess you could say the blessing that people in Puerto Rico are very, very connected mm -hmm. to all of this mm -hmm. because of these groups but that, that uh, Mustafa mentioned, but also the press is very active in covering all of this. So people take a, a direct, um, People have direct knowledge of what's going on and they actually participate a lot in discussions on what to do in terms of environmental issues that has affected them for a long time. So I don't know if um, following the model, I guess, of the press in Puerto Rico and how it deals with the, the penetration that it has with its community could be a way to address some of the issues that you talked about here in this conversation regarding knowledge of black communities and Latino communities here on these issues. Okay, before we move on to our introductions, uh, we wanted to, uh, Rebecca Aguilar raised the issue of Latinos 
And uh, Caroline Brewer had um, an answer about uh, you know, how Latino involvement in these issues. So does either of you want to say whether you're, you got the answer you needed and can just briefly tell the rest of us uh, what the answer is? Well, I'll, I'll ask the question, by the way. Yes. I'm Rebecca Aguilar, president-elect of the Society of Professional Journalists, a freelancer in Dallas, Texas. Uh, so I'm so proud of this conversation. Uh, Mustafa and all of you have inspired me. I think that, yes, journalists haven't done enough on the environment. And I think sometimes the journalists of color are so busy uh, trying to tell all the other stories about the communities that sometimes the environment falls to the bottom unless there is some kind of pollution or uh, you know contaminated water issue affecting our communities. We have to do better, you're right. Uh, but as I'm listening to it, uh, all of you and, and the, you know all the environment, environmentalists who are black, uh, I keep thinking of the Latino community. You know, we have, I mean, I was a migrant worker when I was a kid. I remember the you know, pesticides and all this stuff. I mean, my legs would swell up from all the stuff. Um, and so I think about, you know, what, if you know, and maybe Mustafa knows or anybody who wants to jump in, uh, what is, what is, um, are there Latino environmentalists out there that we should know about? I mean, of course you must probably say, well, as journalists, you should know. Yeah, I mean, I do as much research as I can, but I'm asking you, um, is there a movement out there? Is there one that um, is bilingual? Um, yeah. Anybody? Well, the, an the answer is yes. I'll just jump in real quick and then whoever else wants to. So let me just call out some of the luminaries. There are a whole bunch, so I don't want to get in trouble, but just real quickly. Angelo Logan, who runs, uh, who leads the Moving Forward Network, um, is incredible. And they have hundreds and hundreds of uh, communities that are underneath of their umbrella. Elizabeth Yampierre out of Brooklyn, New York, who runs Uprose, is a force um, and is doing incredible work, both on the local and the national and the international stage. You have Juan Parras from Tejas, uh, who is there uh, in Houston, Texas, um, specifically in the Manchester community. You have Kim Wasserman Schultz, um, who's with Lavejo, Little Village Environmental Justice Organization out of Chicago. You have Richard Moore, one of the deans of the environmental justice movement, who is with the Los Adinos Institute and used to be with the Southwest Network for Economic and Environmental Justice. I mean, you can go on and on uh, of just incredible folks um, who are, um, who are, are Latinx uh, and who have been a part of, of the foundation of the movement and who are a part of the future of the movement. Um, so those are just a quick few of uh, a laundry list of just, um, just amazing folks. Also um, look at the work of uh, uh, Priscilla Ibarra. She's at the University of North Texas. She's a scholar, um, uh, published uh, some very highly respected work on um, Latinx environmentalism. Excellent, excellent. Thank you all so much. Thank okay, uh, we wanna let everybody know who else is, who actually is here on this call. So we're gonna have our introductions and uh, if you could be brief, that'd be fine. We just wanna find out who's, who's who. Uh, we're going to start with Randall Pinkston, who's the first on my screen. Hello, everybody. I'm, I'm uh, mute. Okay, good. Yeah. Yeah. Hello, everyone. And thank you so much for uh, a wonderful, fascinating uh, conversation. I'm reminded of a few years ago when I was still an active working journalist, when my uh, I worked for CBS News, and they um, had an environmental reporter. Uh, she left, and they never replaced her. And so that goes to... Derek's point earlier about a broadcast media not really doing a good job of, of looking at the mm -hmm. issue. I also appreciated mm -hmm. the mention of Al Jazeera America, uh, where I worked after leaving CBS until it shut down, because BC O'Neill Airy um, was the Al Jazeera America journalist in Flint, Michigan from day one. And I would say Al Jazeera America did as good a job, if not the best job of anyone, because we never left. Um, finally, just a thought. So I, most of you know, I'm from Mississippi. Yeah, I, I, I see it proudly, notwithstanding all the rest of it. One of the things that puzzled the heck out of me about 15 or so years ago, maybe 20, when the solar panels began to become um, uh, sort of popular, was why there were none in a state that gets sunshine 11 months of the year. And I was told, I haven't researched this, that the utility companies had put a law in place that made it difficult for people to hook 
the solar panels to the grid so that you couldn't sell the energy back once you use as much as you wanted. Now, I don't know if that's true or not. And I'm not a working journalist anymore. I have nowhere to put it if I did do a story, but some of you may want to look into that. Uh, why is it that in Southern states, there's such a low usage of solar panels? That's all I have to share. And thank you for inviting me. Okay, thanks, Randall. Okay, we have had Dana, we have Kat, we had Tara on, we've had Mustafa, Lynn. Okay, um, yes, I am the, uh, as I said, I'm the director of the DC graduate program in broadcast and digital journalism capstone program for the Newhouse School at Syracuse University where our students come to Washington for the last six weeks with their master's program and cover Congress for small market television stations around the country, um, which as I was saying is interesting because they have to learn how to connect the dots of what's going on with government with the federal government and how those decisions affect what's going on in their, the markets to which they're assigned. Um, so last year we did it virtually and we did things like uh, voting and voting uh, uh, and food insecurity and housing insecurity and things like that. Interesting to see that with this new format like Zoom, then our students could not only be in touch with people in Washington itself, but to be more in touch with people in the specific areas that they're covering. It's gonna be a change in the way that we do journalism, I really think in terms of broadcast journalism. And we need to be thinking about how that's gonna work, how to make people better prepared for that, how people of color can use that to say that just because I am in say Mississippi, I could still report for other organizations, especially online organizations and do it in a, in a more cohesive way, but anyway. That's who I am, and I'm also on the board of journalism. You certainly are. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Rochelle Riley. You there, Rochelle? I'm there. Thank you so much. I'm Rochelle Riley. I was a columnist for the Detroit Free Press for almost 20 years until 2019, when I left to uh, work for the city of Detroit. I'm a member of the North Carolina and Michigan Journalism Halls of Fame. Very good, very good. And also on the journalism board. And also on the journalism board. Yeah. <laughs> okay. All right, Ivando, we, we know who you are. We know Charles, who you are. Derek, you want to say any more about what you're up to? Uh, sure. Um, I'm on uh, a fellow at the Union of Concerned Scientists. Uh, I also write for grist.org, uh, The Undefeated. Um, and I'm also on the boards of um, uh, the Board of Environmental Health News. Um, and I just also became an advisor to Inside Climate News. All right. Richard, okay. yes. Richard, before you go to the next person, I just want to say I'm also a member of the UNCCH uh, Communication School Foundation Board. And anyone who has not written a letter or made a phone call or made some public statement about the way that they've treated Nicole Hannah-Jones, I would encourage you to do that. Thank That's you. the University of North Carolina, correct? Correct. At University Chapel of Hill. North Carolina yes. at Chapel Hill. Right, okay. All right, Batinta, we know who you are, Sharon Farmer. <laughs> we can't hear you. Unmute, please. I always try to hold myself back because <laughs> ain't enough happening fast enough. I'm getting grayer hair, guys, because stuff ain't right, even with the Biden people. Let's just face it. We can hope and pray somebody's going to do the right thing, but until it's us doing it, until it's us doing it, until it's us doing it, it ain't happening. Everybody else waters us down. I'm for the Native Americans. I'm for the people who ain't never been treated right. And that especially includes us. Okay, thank you. I heard that. Okay, <laughs> Benita Bing. <laughs> oh my God. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Benita Bing. I am the president of the Exposure Group, African American Photographers Association, located here in Washington, D.C. Um, I'm also the producer helping Richard out with this uh, Zoom meeting Thank and uh, also have a studio here in the Brooklyn area on the uh, Arts Walk in, on uh, Monroe Street, Talbert and Bing Studio. So if anybody need any images, let us know. Thank you. All right. Cynthia DuBose. Hi, Cynthia. I'm, hi I'm Cynthia DuBose. 
I'm the managing editor for audience engagement for McClatchy. Um, thank you for having me. I, I snuck on another one earlier, um, I guess two months ago, but I wasn't able to introduce myself. I had another um, commitment. So I appreciate the conversation, especially from the local angle, which is where I come from and always trying to represent um, our 29 markets, some of whom are very small. Excellent. Thank, thank you. you. Back to you. All right, Chevry, Chevry Lassiter. Hi, I'm Chevry Lassiter. Happy birthday again, Chevry. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> I'm, um, I'm a um, photo editor for the Washington Informer, also the um, producer of Denise's show, Washington Informer News TV, Win TV, every Friday at noon on Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter. Very good, okay. Hazel. I co-produce with Richard, yeah. Okay, Hazel Abney. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Good afternoon. I'm Hazel Trice Edney, editor in chief of the Trice Edney Newswire, um, president and CEO of Trice Edney Communications, and I am an adjunct professor at the Kathy Hughes School of Communications at Howard University. Hey, Professor Lamb. Um, I would like to add that anybody who feels that you don't have anywhere to put your stories, I heard somebody say something like that. Uh, I'm going to put my email address in the chat. We do pay. Don't pay much, but we do pay. Um, if you have anything concerning environmental racism or anything else Black, please um, remember us, the tri Sydney Newswire. We're about to launch a whole new website. Oh, wow. Okay, Mary Curtis. Mary C. Curtis. Hey, uh, yes, my grandma. Mary C. Curtis, um, based now, right now in Charlotte, North Carolina, uh, particularly with COVID. I'm a columnist at a Roll Call covering politics, culture, and race. I'm host of the CQ Roll Call, a podcast equal time with Mary C. Curtis. Michael Steele was our guest this week. Um, I'm a senior leader at the Op-Ed Project. And I'm actually also on the board of the Ann O'Hare McCormick Scholarships. We give scholarships to women who have been accepted to Columbia Journalism School, uh, City University of New York, uh, Newmark School, and NYU. And we're always anxious to have women of color apply. We just gave uh, some out and we were well represented. So share any educators on there, please share that. All right, Corey Johnson. Unmute. Hey everyone, my name is Corey uh, Johnson. I am a senior investigative reporter at the Tampa Bay Times, uh, the Florida's largest newspaper. I'm uh, very, very honored to be among you. Uh, for the last 18 months, uh, I have, I and two other reporters have been uh, investigating a lead smelter, which has poisoned hundreds of its work workers and their families. These workers were predominantly black. Uh, they were uh, uh, immigrants from Haiti, uh, Jamaica, uh, Nigeria. Uh, the workers were unaware uh, that on, on many days, the lead and the other poisons were hundreds of times higher than what their respirators could protect against. So we've, we've uh, documented at least 15 heart attacks, strokes, and several deaths within the last five years, and that number is growing. Um, and so uh, this is my first entry into uh, environmental racism. Uh, if you haven't seen the story, I will welcome you to take a look. Um, the stories have already triggered. OSHA, OSHA has been out to the plant for about a month. The EPA is also involved now and the Department of Justice involved. And so uh, these issues that you all are discussing today uh, were have been high on my mind for the last two years. And I'm just uh, deeply honored that I was able to just be among you and to learn and to listen. And so uh, that's my story, I'm sticking to it. <laughs> All right, Yvonne, quickly, I think you said who you were, but you can do it again if you want. Yes, Ivan Kroman, um, I'm a freelance journalist out of D.C. and a communications consultant, and I um, was former executive director of the National Association of Hispanic Journalists, and as part of that worked with um, all the different organizations within Unity, the now defunct Unity. 
Okay, Yannick Rice Lamb. Hello, everyone. I'm Yannick Rice Lamb. I'm a professor of journalism at Howard University in the Department of Media, Journalism, and Film in the Kathy Hughes School of Communications. And I'm also a co founder of FierceForBlackWomen.com. Okay, Denise Rolock Barnes. Pushing the wrong buttons. <laughs> um, hi, Denise Rolock Barnes, publisher of the Washington Informer newspaper. I'm glad to be here. Um, two things. One, I wanted to echo what Hazel said. Don't underestimate the Black press. If you got stories, we do pay. And also Black Press of, um, what is it? Black Press of America, mm -hmm. uh, NPA site, as well as Hazel's and the Informer. Um, and and um, Richard knew I was going to raise this, but the <laughs> NPA right. is looking for, is desperately looking for a judge of our um, messenger awards. It's the judging is this week. And if you have time to do some digital judging of black newspapers on various topics, just put your information in the chat and I'll have someone to reach out to you. And I thank you in advance for considering this. Thank you, Richard. All right. Very good. Uh, Hamil. Hamil Harris. Hey, hey everybody. Hamil Harris. I'm, I write for a number of publications <laughs> like Denise Rolock Warren, Washington Formal, Hazel Edney. And I'm still doing a little work with the post, but I teach at the University of Maryland. I'm an adjunct professor, and I, I was at Morgan for four years, and I love everybody. This is so wonderful that we can still get fired up and stuff. And Richard, thank you so much. And it's just a blessing to see everybody. And I'm trying to do better with my health, so I'm hanging in there. Excellent. But I just love everyone, and, and Yannick, and we just got to keep together like this. Right. Okay, Eleanor Vega, are you still here? She just said she had to leave. Okay, I wanted her to introduce herself. But speaking of the chat, uh, I forgot to mention that, that Media Matters for America uh, wanted to find out uh, if, if people here would like to uh, leave their contact information so that they can keep up uh, with them. So if you, if you would like to do so, please put that in the chat and I'll forward it to, the, to, the, to those folks. Okay, uh, all right. Rebecca, I think you introduced yourself. Claudette James. Hi, good afternoon, Claudette James, Truth and Education, Journalism, um, between New York City and Philadelphia. And I truly appreciate the information today, looking forward to seeing the evolution of higher education institutions and newsrooms focusing on environmental justice issues. Amazing conversation today. Thank you. Okay, Fergus Shield. Uh, hi, thanks, Richard. Uh, I'm Fergus Shield. I'm the managing editor of uh, the International Consortium of Investigative Journalists in Washington, D.C. And what we have spent the past 15 years doing is uncovering who owns shell companies. And some of those shell companies, those many thousands of shell companies are involved in some of the worst environmental disasters uh, in many countries. And one of the, the very um, minimum things that I think could be done is that, say, for example, the people in St. Croix, at the very least, they should know who owns the company that is polluting their waters. That is the minimum. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, in countries across the world, people can't even find out who the polluters are. And that's what ICIJ does. All right, thank you. Uh, Paul Delaney. Hi, Paul Delaney. Uh, spent most of my career at the New York Times. Uh, it is so great to see a lot of friends from, from the past. Joel, uh, from Paris, Derek, Randall, Rochelle, Mary Curtis, uh, Jason, etc. It's great seeing everybody. All right, and Paul's on our organizing committee for the roundtables as well, so that's great. All right, Vernon, Vernon Smith, Vernon Smith. Uh, hey, good afternoon, everybody. I'm the other Vern Smith. Uh, <laughs> early in my career um, at the uh, St. Petersburg Times, I covered the environmental beat. And now, uh, fast forward, I'm working for NOAA, uh, the National Ocean Service part of NOAA. And I've, I've gotten a sort of a flip side perspective of the whole um, environmental issue in terms of the lack of diversity, just like you know, back when I was in the, uh, the newspaper business, 
the uh, when it comes to uh, scientists of color at, at government agencies, uh, we make up a very, very small percentage. And so uh, one of the things that uh, needs to happen that I want to encourage my uh, journalism educator friends and, and just uh, those of you all who are uh, engaging with uh, young people to encourage them to get involved in the sciences so that they can perhaps, you know, work at agencies like NOAA and EPA. There's a lot of, there's a lot of uh, uh, co-mingling between, you know, the folks who work in government and then they go work for these foundations um, and enviro green enviro groups that are predominantly white. Um, in order to, you know, change that paradigm, we've got to get, um, we've got, we need to be re represented in all those spaces. So just want to throw that out there. Also, um, our foundation, the National Marine, Marine Sanctuary Foundation is having a conference next month to talk about DEI with regard to the ocean space. I put a link in the chat for anybody who wants to check it out. Thank you, thank you, Vern. John Yearwood. Hey, Richard, good to see you as always. Another great uh, Sunday chat. Um, wanted to um, mention a couple things. One, um, that since I was last on the round table, Richard, I've got a slightly different job at Politico. I'm now the uh, global news editor at Politico, uh, moving from- uh, Congratulations. Uh, thank you, moving from a deputy on, um, on trade and ag. Um, and um, with that, I wanted to uh, get some help from round table colleagues that we, are, we have a couple of job openings, namely a China editor and a national security editor. And um, if anyone uh, knows of um, a few people that we should uh, consider, I would really appreciate that. And I can drop my, um, my email in the, in the chat. It's jyearwood at politico.com. Uh, also, uh, I'm currently a board member of the national, of the, um, uh, uh, actually I used to be a board member of the National Association of Black Journalists, um, uh, treasurer, but also I'm with the International Press Institute in Vienna. Uh, that's it. Thank you, Excellent. Richard. Always, always good seeing you and uh, colleagues on the round table. Likewise. likewise. Uh, Christoph, we wanted to congratulate him on his new job. He's moving to the Washington area, so I'll let him introduce himself and tell us about that. Well, thanks very much. First of all, Richard, I want to thank you so much for uh, inviting me and welcoming me into this forum. I greatly appreciate it. Um, shout out to Dean Batts. Congratulations uh, uh, on your role at uh, Arizona State. Uh, as for myself, I'm currently based in Philadelphia, just a uh, mile or so up the road from the uh, Rocky Steps and uh, not far away from where the Philadelphia 76ers are beginning their uh, climb towards an NBA championship this year. Um, <laughs> so we believe. <laughs> And I just inject some controversy into that. Um, <laughs> but uh, I'll be down the road in, uh, in the Washington, D.C. area. I will be starting as a visiting assistant professor of racing media at the Philip Merrill, Merrill College of Journalism uh, down there at the University of Maryland. I'm very happy and gratified to be starting that role. I'm presently a Ph.D. candidate at uh, Rutgers University up in New Brunswick. Uh, my dissertation examines and compares how local commercial and nonprofit uh, news media uh, serve black communities in the southern U US. Um, I grew up primarily in the Washington DC area, but I have deep, deep family roots in Texas and Louisiana. I spent my summers um, as a kid in, in East Texas. Um, so the South mm -hmm. is an area that's, that's very near and dear to me. Uh, and past lives, I was a telecommunications uh, policy summer fellow at the Brookings Institution. I was also a uh, producer for WBOK 1230, um, a black owned community radio station in uh, New Orleans, one of my favorite cities uh, in the world. So thank you so much for allowing me to, uh, to participate and I look forward to obviously participating in the future. All right, love to, Lo uh, glad, to glad you're here. Uh, Jason Michelo Johnson. Unmute please. Got it. Hello everybody, um, I'm a, Freelance photographer, currently in Savannah, teaching at Savannah State University as an adjunct. I'm actually the founder of the African American Photographers Association in Washington, D.C. And I've been the NABJ official photographer for 30 years. Mm. So I know what you all looked like 30 years ago, many of you. <laughs> <laughs> Got to prove it. So that's for me working on a historic book uh, called Legends 
of my lifetime, mm -hmm. 75 black men who influenced America. Take care. Very good. Jason, we all look the same as we did 30 years ago. <laughs> okay. A smaller, Jason, do you have a smaller picture of me? Yeah. <laughs> Got all of that. Yeah. All right, Chuck Stevens. <laughs> Chuck, excuse me. <laughs> Uh, I'm you, Chuck. All right. Yeah. Uh, not my first rodeo, but may appear so. Uh, Chuck Stevens, former, uh, formerly with Bloomberg News and the Wall Street Journal. I'm a freelance uh, journalist right now, and I'm a member of the Alumni Advisory Board at Syracuse University's uh, Newhouse School and uh, co-chair of its DEI committee. Very good, thank you, Chuck. Uh, Gloria Gonzalez, first timer. Hey, how are you? Thank you for having me. Uh, my name is Gloria Gonzalez. I'm the deputy energy editor at Politico of, as of three months ago, uh, so fairly new to the publication. Uh, I'm also a former board member of the Society of Environmental Journalists. Um, several of my former board member colleagues uh, have been on the call today, which is great. Uh, I'm also a Newhouse alum, so I also appreciate all the Syracuse uh, representation. <laughs> um, just wanted to echo really quickly a point that Rebecca made that I thought was a, was a, was a terrific point because it's something that I've struggled with as a journalist um, covering these issues for 20 plus years. Mm. Um, it's always the, one of the biggest challenges I felt I feel is that we're stretched too thinly, right? There's too many, there's so many important stories that we have to tell, we want to tell, and it, not enough time, not enough resources. Uh, I remember a couple of years ago, I went to Puerto Rico, um, family from there. I was born in Brooklyn, if you couldn't tell, but my parents <laughs> were both born on the island. Uh, and uh, so I went to uh, Puerto Rico to report on the aftermath of uh, Hurricane Maria and the uh, recovery or really lack thereof um, at the time. And still going on, unfortunately. Uh, so I, I came back, I did a package of stories and then I had to pivot to covering workplace safety uh, issues that were going on. And so, um, you know, it's often the dilemma is, you know, which important stories, you know, can you tell, do you tell um, and how do you tell them? And so, you know, I think one of the biggest things, you know, folks can do is just really work with us to, you know, bring information to us. I, I would love to be more proactive on multiple fronts, but I'm one person with limited time. So um, maybe there's a way we can all work together to share that type of information and, and get those stories out there. Well, you have the Society of Environmental Journalists. Is that a their resource? Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I've been, I've been on the board um, and a member of the organization since 2008. And so okay. we often share, uh, we have our listers, we share sources, we, we share stories. Um, and so, you know, there, there have been times where I've said, hey, I've heard this, you know, anybody want to tackle it? And I've had other people say the same to me or, you know, we'll connect and say, you know, I just spoke to this person and they would be a great resource for you for, you, for, for these types of stories. And so we definitely do um, use that as a mechanism to share our tools and information. But everybody's not in that society of environmental That's journalism. the issue. And I think <laughs> one of the challenges we have is that people think society of environmental journalists, but it's like we talk been discussed earlier it's not just environmental issues these are all connected it's yes. a health care it's 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 transportation equity it's everything is 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 connected and and you know we want to get that message out that we are not strictly environmental journalists it's it's so much bigger than that here here okay uh, israel balderas uh hi everyone i'm israel balderas richard thank you so much for the invite uh Excellent. currently I'm an assistant professor of journalism at Palm Beach Atlantic University in South Florida. I say currently because I have accepted a, an academic uh, position at Elon University. I will be an assistant professor of journalism teaching predominantly First Amendment law. And I get to work with uh, an amazing dean. Many of you know her, Rochelle Ford, a long oh, yes. peer. Uh, so I get to work with her and, and just to show the commitment of Elon University to D. E I, uh, I think I'm the only Hispanic academic at, uh, at Elon. I hope to meet more if I'm wrong. Uh, I was a broadcast journalist for over 20 years. Many of those years were spent in Washington, DC. So as a young reporter, uh, Denise Rolock Barnes uh, you know, bravely uh, offered me to be part of her television show on Fridays in the <laughs> round table. Uh, I think I was with Hamil a couple of times in that round table. 
Mm -hmm. uh, part of a reporter with New Urban Entertainment Television, which was a startup cable network uh, by Quincy Jones back in the 2000s. Um, and now I am a member of SPJ with Rebecca Aguilar. I'm a member of the FOIA committee where we've been trying to make sure that any federal anti-slap legislation is not used against environmental groups. Uh, and, uh, and so we're working to make sure that that will happen. I'm also a Solutions Journalism Network fellow. Solutions Journalism tries to report a 360 approach uh, specifically to climate uh, crisis stories uh, and look at what groups are doing to, to better that issue. Uh, and uh, again, as an educator, uh, it's been fun to hear uh, what, what people are doing so that I can take it back into the classroom. And like Dean Batts was saying, try to get the next generation of journalists to make sure they pay uh, attention to this important issue. So thank you for a great conversation today, Richard. And we work together. <laughs> and oh, I'm sorry, Mary, I'm sorry, yes. Sorry, I didn't wanna just list my, 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 my resume, but Mary Curtis and I actually worked together in Charlotte when I was a morning anchor at Fox Charlotte. Uh, and, and Mary and I would have some great conversations uh, on politics, but the great thing is it wasn't in DC. It was in Charlotte, so we didn't have to deal with the DC babble. So it was great. In Israel, do you still fight and debate on TV? We used to have some wars, man. Uh, Hamil, I had so much fun. I, I think we scared Denise a couple of times. No. Nowadays, I I'm food. coming to Elon just to debate you down there. Okay, I'm coming down. There. Come on down, Elon University. Uh, we have a fantastic journalism program, and I'm really excited to see. What I can do, uh, I'm an attorney, so for me to teach First Amendment law, it's a lot of fun. It's good. You're going to do good. It's good to see you. Bring tears to my eyes. Good to see you, <laughs> to see you Denise. Again, such a pleasure. I remember you took a chance on me. Oh, no. I, we were all taking chances, so here we are. <laughs> the round table, Denise, is still around, man. <laughs> <laughs> okay, now, since people put their contact information in the chat, does that mean that it's okay for me to share this with uh, the Media Matters folks? They hiring people or something? All right. Well, I guess. All right. So nobody's. All right. Nobody said no. So, Richard, what yes. are they? Gonna, I'm sorry. What are they going to do with our information? I mean, they like, want to. I just want to make sure I'm not bombarded with ads and things like that. You know. Right. 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 Well, uh, uh, if uh, let's see, I think that they want to just to keep put you on their mailing list, basically. Well, that don't help. Yeah. Is that is that where's it? Is, is Yvonne here still? Yeah, I'm answer that question. I, what yeah, do you, why don't you answer that question? Yeah, I, um, I, from my understanding, we just want to, if there was an ask from our communication department, to make sure that we're sharing our stories with journalists of, of color, just expanding our, our list. You know, we, we have a lot of the like, legacy media on it, but we just want to expand our outreach. I think it's as simple as that. And you okay. won't be bombarded with spam, just relevant studies or also it's a two-way street if there are any any studies or research you want us to look into or anything at the local level that you want to draw our attention to you can reach out to us as well and we'll be a resource so, thank you thank you thank you so does that meet your test uh, rebecca i just i, I get like 100 emails a day so you know <laughs> spj the fbi you name it and i just don't want to i don't want somebody selling me mascara you know i understand <laughs> Okay. All right. We have uh, about 10 minutes before we get to 3.30. So does anyone have anything else they want to uh, talk about or raise? Yeah, Sharon. I want to remind everybody, if you don't want to look like this, we all have to talk about the environment because you're going to all look like this. We don't have a lot of hope. We're running out of time. So let's not run out of no more time. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Anybody else? No more final thoughts? I want to say that, you know, speaking of resilience, as Native people, we've been on this land for over 15,000 years, and that is the definition of resiliency and sustainability. And um, so I, I am officially saying that I'm here to work. I do a lot of DEI work on my own campus. I teach American Indian Studies at Cal State San Marcos in Southern California. And um, I have a faculty fellow appointment to, to deepen this work. Uh, and this is why I'm so honored to be in this conversation. It's really important to forge 
um, deeper bonds of intersectionality between our departments as we've all sort of talked about the siloing of of our uh, interests and and that that is hurting us and so um, it's really uh, it, it's foremost in my my uh, agenda right now to to forge deeper connections with my um, black brothers and sisters and how we can talk about um, better justice uh, for all of us on stolen indigenous lands. So let us let us work toward that in the future, and that way we unite and we are we are stronger together. Okay. Richard, uh, is is there, who's next? This is Caroline again. Yes. Um, I just wanted to say that a simple Google search for spokespersons who are Black, Latino, uh, Native. Uh, Asian uh, will turn up a lot of names. There are a lot more stories that have been done. And so many of these people do not have media or communications departments. So it's very difficult for them to reach out on their own. But once they are found and their stories are told, then people start uh, to, to look for them. So I think that's an excellent way, along with all the other resources that have been provided today, uh, to find some of the people that you might be interested in talking to. Okay, very good. Hey, Richard. Yes, she, yes, Emil. She's very modest, but she's an outstanding children's book author, and she oh, yeah. has a lot of great books out. Her birthday was recently, too, so Carolyn, at least you ought to show what's on your wall, because right now, as a father of four, and my youngest is 14, people need a healthy environment stuff, you know? And not just the physical, but just the mental environment. They're here. Thank uh, you. Richard, very kind. Yes. Yeah, Richard, I just, I um, yes. wanted to say, and, and the conversation didn't go here, but, you know, as one that lives in D.C. in a community, you know, that's besieged by a lot of um, racial and social justice issues, when we talk about environmental uh, racism, you know, I also am concerned about a community where um, we have a tendency to trash our own neighborhoods. Mm. And so if you drive around the city and trying to, ex I mean, around this area particularly where, you know, trash collection is not as frequent as in other places, street cleaning doesn't happen often. Uh, and at the same time, you know, the, a lot of this goes into our, our wastewater system and into the Anacostia River and how we can convince, you know, individual households or individuals. I mean, we, we, we have a way of just tossing stuff out of our car windows, leaving trash in front of people's homes, you know, in front of our own homes and people take the responsibility to clean it. But, you know, it's like I told somebody once, it is on us to clean this because the city's not gonna do it as frequently as we would want them to. But I, I'm really curious about I've seen an effort, I think, out of Houston or Dallas that really addressed that issue. And I'm looking for examples of that to bring, uh, to share maybe in DC, in this community, to see how we can take personal responsibility for keeping our own neighborhoods clean. And okay. that's, to me, that's an environmental issue, you know. Mm -hmm. It is. Well, everybody has your contact information, it's in the chat. And after this is over, we're, I'm going to distribute this the chat to everybody who was here. Now, uh, Charles Lee had another has hand up too. Yeah, no, I just wanted to thank you, Richard, for inviting me to this uh, conversation and uh, and tell everyone how much I learned from all of you and uh, how much I was inspired by this conversation. And you know, um, I grew up. Um, um, I've been working a long time on this issue with um, Ben Chavis and others back at the UCC, you know, but, and, um, and, you and uh, we're all learning as we go. So like Adina and many of you who offer insights in terms of how to think about these issues as, you know, I really uh, have learned a lot and, uh, and, um, you know, look forward to working with you all more. Excellent. Okay. Okay, uh, anybody else? Hey, now, Richard, somebody... uh, yeah. Richard, uh, this oh, is yeah, John. John. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, this was a really fascinating uh, discussion and conversation with Frau. Huh? United States, but I appreciate it to those of you who mentioned uh, that we're seeing some of these things uh, happening overseas as well. 
Yeah. Uh, I think someone mentioned care, you know, parts of the career. I'm from Trinidad, as you know, and there are some huge uh, environmental racism issues down there. And I just want to point out that organizations such as the Pulitzer Center and others have um, uh, real generous grants for anyone who wants to uh, look at uh, you know, environmental racism and other issues uh, overseas, as you know, uh, in different parts of Latin America, not as much in the Caribbean, but we're seeing some uh, worrying signs in Jamaica. The Chinese are coming in and doing some things that are uh, getting a lot of people's attention. So there are a lot of stories out there that are happening outside of the country. And uh, Attention in a negative way or a positive way or what? I'm sorry? The Chinese are getting attention in a negative way or a positive way or what? Uh, sort of a, ne a negative way in, in terms of you know what they're doing in terms of um, uh, you know purchasing this island and using it um, for import export and things like that. Hmm. But um, and 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 that's just Jamaica. There are worse, much worse cases in parts of Latin America. But um, but anyway, there's some great stories out there to tell, and uh, there's funding out there for people who'd like to tell them. Hmm. Thank you. That that's that's interesting. Okay. Um... Is anybody else? That's it. Uh, somebody has, oh, did you say, okay. Anyway, uh, somebody has suggested that our next round table be on podcast, podcasting, and how journalists can, can do a good job doing that. And so if anybody has any suggestions as to uh, people who can talk about that, uh, that would interest us, uh, just let me know. And in the meantime, I uh, will say thank you all for coming. I, I think, and thanks to the people who are watching on Facebook Live. Uh, for the people who are here, uh, as I said, I, I'll print out this chat and distribute it. And of course, we'll all, also have uh, a narrative coming and uh, uh, it's recorded. So it'll be on YouTube. Thanks to Chevry. And we'll have photographs, Sharon's photographs, and then I'll write a narrative. <laughs> so thank you all very much. And hopefully we'll see you next month. All right. Thank you. Richard. Thank you. All right. All right. Okay. And don't forget, you don't want to look like this. <laughs> okay, if this stuff ends. Thank you. It's a wrap. It's a wrap. <laughs>